Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. It was the time when our school had planned a summer camp trip, which was supposed to be held at Blackwood Campground in Mount Desert, Maine. Even though I was unwilling to go there, my parents still sent me. They packed entire luggage for me, which includes food, beverages, clothing, categorized different activities, etc. My parents came to the school to see me off, which felt embarrassing to me. But after seeing some other parents as well, I felt a bit relieved. But I had the biggest luggage among all, and as I was the school nerd, so other kids started to make fun of me. The kids in our school was also divided into different groups. The rich kids, the cool kids, the geeks, the nerds, and the ones whom no one takes notice of. There was a guy amongst the cool kids, Noah, whom I had a major crush on. It was not because he was cool or something, but because he never made fun of me. And even when his friends would make fun of me, he would simply change the topic to something else to distract them from making fun of me. He never talked with me or made eye contact with me, but I had a feeling buried deep inside which said he liked me. I often used to daydream about me, but never let anyone find out about it. I used to sit on the third seat from the starting second row, and he used to sit on the last row among his friends. And sometimes during the class, I would steal a few glances of him in which he would either be sleeping or gossiping with his friends. I never once saw him focusing on the class. Every time I looked at him, my heart would start beating uncontrollably. Wasn't there a bigger luggage for you to bring, Portia? Miss Geller, who was one of the teachers assigned to watch over the summer camp, said to me jokingly, which made everyone present there to laugh. I felt so embarrassed that I wanted to dig my grave right there and hide inside it. But I quietly got on the bus and went there to sit on my seat. Move it, nerd. This seat is reserved for Noah and me. As I was about to sit, a girl pushed me from behind, sat in one of the seats while putting her bag on the other. I looked at her for a few seconds, but then went ahead and sat on the only empty seat left, which was behind Miss Portia. Everyone was laughing, playing games, singing, and talking during the ride, enjoying it, while I was the only one sitting alone looking at everyone. I was feeling so out of place, which was making me feel awkward. So I took out a book that I had brought for just a time like this. We reached the camp and the activity started. During the activities, no one was ready to pair up with me except for the kids who no one cared about, and they all looked like they did not care if anyone gave a damn about them. I couldn't help but notice that Noah was behaving differently than usual. I saw him snickering when other kids was bullying and making fun of me which stabbed like a sharp knife in my heart. I was feeling disturbed due to his indifferent behavior during the entire camp and wanted to talk to him about it, but I wasn't able to gather enough courage for it. On the last day of summer camp, I made up my mind to talk to him no matter what. The last activity we were supposed to do was rock climbing, and I decided to talk to him before that. And it's not like I didn't talk at all, I did talk to him just briefly, and the teacher called us for our turns after that. I was the first one to go, and Noah was supposed to climb after me, but I denied because I wasn't feeling well, and sat near a rock and started to watch them. When Noah had climbed more than halfway down, his rope along with safety rope suddenly broke altogether, and he fell down. Those who were climbing along with him tried to help but it was too late. Noah did not die from the fall, but he sustained many serious and permanent injuries. Everyone was trying to figure out how is that possible even after so many safety gears and precautions involved at the site. As they were taking him to the emergency, I was somehow feeling relieved. It was the last night on the camp when I saw the same girl who pushed me on the bus making out with him, which made me extremely furious and disgusted towards Noah. That was when, out of the rage, I sneakily cut all the ropes, carefully knowing that Noah's turn would be the fifth one. I did not cut it completely, instead in the way which only breaks after four kids' turns were passed, and I did it 
after the advanced safety checkup so no one would suspect me. But I thought of telling him to stop if he were to explain the situation positively to me. And when I went to talk to him, he brushed me off, saying I always disgusted him and I was never worth his time. After hearing those words from him, I felt such hatred towards him that I never felt before. So I decided to let things be. Noah's hands and legs were badly fractured, and he also sustained some injuries on his head. His parents wanted to sue the teachers for being careless, but somehow the whole matter was cooled down. It was found out that someone had cut the ropes in advance, but because no one saw me and there was no surveillance camera installed at the time, no one was able to find who the culprit was. The problem kids were questioned, but as I had skilled fully played the role of a pitiful kid who was always bullied, no one suspected me even a bit. I still feel a bit guilty of Noah's condition, but not that much to feel remorseful for my entire life. The summer was the start of me taking a step forward to the life of crimes. What is it now, Peter? I shouted in frustration when he asked me to stop the car for the third time. I'm thirsty, he said in an apologetic tone. Are you being serious, dude? First, you stopped the car to pee. Second time, you had to pee again, and now you're feeling thirsty? Why? So you can stop for the fourth time to pee again? At this rate, we are never going to make it to Marcus's wedding. I scolded him in frustration. This is the last time, dude, I promise, Peter requested. <sighs> Fine. I'll stop if we see any store open at this hour, I sighed and said. After that... I focused my attention on the road while Peter's eyes were looking for a store. That was when we sighted a 7-Eleven on the side of the road. The signboard looked a bit old and rusty, but the store looked in top condition. I was also getting thirsty, so I decided to listen to him and park the car in the front parking area of the store. As we were getting out of the car, the door got stuck for some reason. We tried for a few minutes. It wasn't opening. I think even our car is tired from stopping so much. Should we continue driving now? I said in a sarcastic voice. Okay, but let's just try one last time. If the door still doesn't open, then we will continue driving, Peter said. I took his advice and gave it another try, and the door opened. We got out of the car and started walking toward the entry gate of 7-Eleven, and that was when the light on the signboard started to fluctuate. I know what you guys may be thinking, but no, we did not think that it was something haunted. Instead, we thought that they should change this old junk. As we walked inside, we saw a gorgeous woman at the cash counter turning her face toward us and saying welcome in her soft voice. I admired her beauty for a minute or so, but then I walked ahead to grab the drinks. And as I was grabbing the drinks, I thought that I should buy edibles as well, because you never know when Peter asked me for the fourth stop. After that, he might feel hungry. So I just went ahead and grabbed some cookies and chips for us, and then walked toward the cash counter. I was not surprised to see that Peter was giving it his all with flirting with this girl. But she wasn't giving him a response and was completely focused on staring at a blue pen that was lying around at the counter. It felt a bit weird to me, but I think Peter wasn't going to budge from there because of any reason. I went ahead and she started billing the products. That was when some weird bad smell hit my nose and I looked around to see if something was spoiled over there, but everything looked fresh and clean to me. I looked over at Peter and the girl, but they did not seem bothered by it, so I thought that it must be my imagination. After the billing was done, I made my payment and started to walk out of the door. But Peter was still standing there trying to talk to her. Dude, are you coming or should I just leave you behind? I said in frustration, because the longer we stayed here, the later we would be at the wedding and Marcus would kill us. Peter looked at me and silently walked closer. I thought he was going to leave with me, but then he said, can't you be a little late for your best friend? Don't you know how long it's been since I had sex? Please, a little help here. 
Just wait for a few minutes, and if she does not respond, then I will leave with you. I had no other choice because I could not leave this shit of a person behind, so I said fine and stood there waiting. Fifteen minutes passed, but the girl did not give him any response, so I had to drag him out of the place. I could still smell that stench that was just getting stronger, but I still left the place. We drove out of the place and Peter's face was still down, as if I'd just made him drink poison or something. Sam, pass me the drink. By the way, did you smell something bad there? Peter finally spoke after ten minutes of silence, which was the longest he had stayed silent till now. Yeah, I also smelled it. It was like something was spoiled in there. I replied while taking out the drink from the carry bag and handing it to him. The drink felt warm by touch. Felt a bit weird. But then I thought it must be because of the time that had passed since we bought the drinks. You're right, but everything looked fresh and fine to me. He tried to open the can, but it broke, and I turned my head only to see that it was rust and that bad smell had spread throughout the car. Oh, what the hell is that? What did you grab from there when I was distracted, Sam? Peter said while making a disgusted and freaked out face. No, when I picked them up they were just fine. Wait a sec, let me check the other packages. I immediately picked up the bag and saw that it was also in very bad condition, which I instantly threw outside the car window. I was panicking inside, but I told Peter that I may not have noticed it. I know he was freaked out too, but we both acted calm and continued driving in complete silence. After attending the wedding, when we were coming back and passing through the same place in the middle of the day, we noticed 7-Eleven wasn't there. Instead, there was a burned building. I stopped the car and asked around about that. The people who used to live here told us that there used to be a 7-Eleven here about six months ago, but a fire broke out, and it burned. During the fire, a cashier girl who used to work there got stuck, and she died there. She told us that the girl was extremely beautiful. Peter and I looked at each other. Sweat had started to drip from our faces, and we quietly went back inside the car. So, where are you heading now? Rosetta asked me. Rosetta was a part-timer in the Blooming Crest Pizza, where I've been working as a pizza delivery guy. I think she has a crush on me because whenever I'm heading out for delivery, she always asks me about it. But you must be curious, I said sarcastically while showing her the pizza boxes and she started laughing. After that I headed out for the pizza delivery. I checked the time and it was almost 11.47 p.m. Blooming Crust Pizza is a place that is open 24-7 and I'm a night delivery guy. I have my classes during the daytime so that's just the reason for me to join the night shift in the Blooming Crust. And apart from this, there is another small reason for it all. I started my bike and opened up the map to track the location and drove out to the parking. You know, most of the pizza places have that they offer 30 minutes delivery guarantee or free pizza. Yeah, Blooming Crush has that too. So I drove as fast as I could. I reached the place and there was a party going on there. I delivered the pizza, asked the guy who was picking up the delivery to rate positively for me and turned around. As I was coming back, I saw a drunk girl walking while stumbling down the road. I stopped her and asked her what had happened. She looked quite drunk to me. I said, I'm fine. I don't care if he makes out or has sex with some other girl. I'm fine. I only asked her if she was okay, but she started drunk and rambling. The girl had long black curly hair with big almond eyes and a small face that matched her slender figure. Now you must be thinking, why am I describing her like this? It's because I have a weakness for girls with these features. After rambling for a few minutes, she passed out. I picked her up, put her on my bike, and then drove towards the woods near the pizza place. Those woods were abandoned, so I took the girl there, placed her on the ground, took a syringe, and injected the fluids into her body. After that, I went back to work. I reached the pizza place on time, and Rosetta was there. She looked at me, passed a smile, and went back to work. Rosetta was a nice girl. She had a figure and a bubbly personality, but she wasn't the type of girl who would pique my interest. I focused on my work after that. My shift used to end around 5.30 a.m., and as soon as my shift ended, I headed to the woods. There was a small abandoned cabin in the woods, which I'd set up and locked up by myself. 
just because I'm the one who mostly uses it now. I unlocked the cabin door and went inside. The girl was unconscious. I checked her pulse and she was still alive. I looked at her and smiled. Now don't blame me for what's about to happen to you. It's their fault. Your friends should have ordered from the Blooming Crust then because they got me as their pizza delivery guy. I laughed loudly while caressing her face with my big hands. It was so small that I could just grab it and crush it with my bare hands. Oh god, the satisfaction I was feeling just thinking about it. But I wasn't going to waste this opportunity by killing her like that. At least not yet. I put her up, I carried her in my arms, and laid her on the wooden bench. There were cufferings installed at the wooden bench, and I locked her hands with those. She was still unconscious. I guess I may have given her a heavier dose. I did not have enough time for her to wake up, so I began. I went near the corner where I had hidden a box in the safe that I built in the ground. I opened it and took out the trench knife and went there where she was tied. I crouched near her head and grabbed her hair with one hand. It was so silky and soft, I put my face there and sniffed it. It was smelling like jasmine with a hint of tequila. Before it crept upon me and filled my senses, I couldn't control my urges any longer. I started to slash her hair from the scalp, and the sudden pain from that woke the girl up. The crimson red blood flowing down her scalp covering her face and hair, mixed with her screams, were taking over the rest of my senses. Shush, it's going to be fine. You'll be feeling this pain only for some time. But look on the bright side, your beauty looks ten times better like this. This red blood is complimenting your gorgeous black curly hair. Kissed her lips while tasting her blood and said this to her in a hushed tone. Her eyes started to get bigger and filled with blood making them gorgeously horrible to look at. All of this was making me feel so good that I cannot describe it to you. I knew that when this would end, it was going to make me feel horrible and guilty to the extent that I would want to kill myself, but I completely blocked these feelings of me and focused on what I was going to do. I checked the time and it was 6.40 a.m., that was when I remembered that I had reached my class around 8.30 a.m. So I had to finish it before that. Sorry, dear. I guess this is where our fun ends. I stabbed her in the chest after saying that. When I was carving her heart out, she let out a silent howl in pain, which made my chest tight with an uneasy feeling. She died and I put her heart in a small box. I went backside to the cabin and there was a flower field over there. As I dug a small hole in the ground, put the box inside and planted the flowering plant on it. After that, I went inside and took the body outside. I whistled and Silver came running towards me. Oh, I guess I forgot to mention that I had rescued a wolf cub and raised her here. She understood what she had to do as soon as she smelled this girl's body. She started feasting on her and I went inside the cabin to wash it off. Silver howled and I knew that she had invited her friends to share her food. I headed out from my apartment when I finished washing the cabin with bleach. I went to my class after that and to the gym after class. My day was productive as usual. I keep myself busy to avoid the extreme guilt I feel after killing. I had my dinner around 9.30 p.m. and then I headed towards the Blooming Crust Pizza for my work. Rosetta was early as always and, and as I entered she gave me a big bright smile. I imagined her blonde hair covered in red but it did not seem like a good sight. I thought it would stain which would not be pretty at all. Delivery for downtown, there was a party going on there, and make sure to ask for a positive review. Counterboy said while handing me a box of pizzas. I took them and I headed out for my next pizza delivery. It was mid-April when I decided to take all the paid leaves at once that I had been skipping for over a year now. I was going to relax, date, and enjoy the rest of my free days. So I installed Grinder and created a profile for myself. After that, I went ahead and prepared a bubble bath with a lavender aroma to soak my body. And as the preparations were complete, I stripped and dipped myself in the bathtub. My name is Peter Anderson. I am a 27-year-old gay who lives in his huge house that I inherited from my father's death all to myself. Being gay in today's world is quite different, but I have to endure the criticism that comes my way along with my identity, and to be honest, I'm used to it. The hardest part was that not many people knew about being gay, which were only a few old friends, and at my work, no one did. On top of that, I preferred it that way. After an hour of relaxing, I got out and went to the kitchen to eat something while scrolling through my phone. And that is when I got a notification that I was matched with a guy named Carlos. After giving a thorough inspection of his profile, I found that he was just my type. 
so I texted him a hello. He replied within seconds, and we started talking. He seemed like a nice guy, and our interests were similar as well, so I came to develop feelings for him. It wasn't that strong yet. Instead, it was something like a crush of sorts. Anyway, one day, as we were having some flirty conversation, he asked me if he could come over. I hesitated for a bit because I had never brought anyone into my home before, but still, I agreed, and we decided to meet the next night around 10 p.m. for some Netflix and chill. The next day, I cleaned the house myself, even though I had a maid, and it was because I wanted everything to go perfectly on this date. It was my first date within two years, and I would hate if something were to go wrong in this. After the preparations were done and everything was ready, food, music, movies, and drinks, I waited for him to arrive. I received a call from him around 9.30, informing him that he had arrived, so I rushed toward the gate to welcome him. As he was walking inside, he looked around the house with an unusual smile on his face, which gave me an ineffable vibe, but I ignored it. Rest of the night, I did not get any such feelings and enjoyed my time with him. The first thing we did was have some dinner with Cabernet Sauvignon wine while having some pleasant conversation about each other. As we were talking, I carefully observed his well-defined body shape, which he seemed to have taken notice of. So he leaned and gave me a light kiss. I couldn't hide my blushing face and gulp the rest of the wine from my glass. After finishing dinner, we decided to move things into the living room and watch some movies. My focus was not on the movie at all, but on his hand that was exploring my body lightly. And as I turned toward him, he pulled me into a passionate kiss, which made me lose all my senses. I don't know if it was the effect of the wine or something else, but my memories went vague after that, and I don't remember much. The next morning, I woke up with a weird headache naked and saw him sleeping next to me. I tried to remember the sweet memories from last night, but after the kiss, it was completely blank. Still, I was sure that we may have made love last night. I smiled while looking at him, and that was when he woke up while rubbing his eyes. He did not say anything and directly went into the bathroom. I decided to make breakfast for us and went to the kitchen. As I got back with a tray in my hand, he was all ready to leave. The moment I opened my mouth to ask him to have breakfast before heading out, he said something that shocked me completely. $35 an hour, and I spent 10 hours here. I take cash. He said it with a casual tone, as if he was trying to have a deal with me for the time we spent last night. What are you talking about? Wasn't this a date? You were the one who asked me out, I said with a trembling voice, still trying to grasp the situation. Yes, it was a date but my dates are not free, so hand me the money. He looked straight into my eyes and said with a threatening tone, I don't have that kind of cash with me. My voice was trembling and slow. Oh, don't lie to me. The moment I walked into this house, I knew you were someone who could afford to have that kind of cash with you. Tick tock, the clock's ticking, or else the amount will be doubled and I will disclose your little secret to the world. <laughs> He laughed with a menace in his voice. I could not believe I was getting blackmailed by someone I liked. Most likely, I got fooled by him. It was not just disappointing, but frustrating as well. I told him to wait here till I get the cash from the other room, and he smiled at me, which now I was feeling disgusted by. I quietly went to the storeroom and grabbed a shovel. With silent footsteps, I walked back to where he was and took a peek in my room. He was over a call and bragging to someone about catching a big fish, which made my anger rise tenfold. I walked there and hit on his head with the shovel, and immediately took the phone and disconnected. As he fell to the ground, I hit him again, and he started bleeding from the back of his neck. By grabbing him by his collar, I pulled him towards me and said, You seemed pretty interested in my house and my riches, right? Want to know how I got it? He looked at me helplessly as I shoved my shirt in his mouth. I raised the shovel and continuously hit his knees as he tried to get up. Apparently, my father killed my mother for it, and after that, he molested me continuously. By the way, he was my stepfather. I know nothing about the one who was responsible for birth. 
Anyway, one night, I had enough, so I killed him with this very shovel. First, I got him drunk, and then cracked his skull open by continuously hitting on his head. Fascinating, isn't it? After that, I burned his body, and nobody found out. Everyone looked at me as a scared, weak child, so I inherited all my parents' wealth. Oops, I guess I hit too hard this time. After hitting another blow, I looked at him and said, I dragged his body to the fire room while humming my favorite song. He's so handsome, it's like I could die by just looking at him. My friends and I were having a slumber party when Brittany remarked on the new pizza delivery guy who had just started a few days ago. Well, she was right. The new pizza guy was handsome. He's on his way, and I just ordered pizza from that place. As I said that, all the other girls squealed in excitement. I was not the type to easily have a crush on someone, but trust me, this guy was a 100% crush material. The day I got a first delivery from him, I started ordering pizza from that place. Daily. Even though the pizza was not that good. I guess it may just be a new strategy for something since the pizza from that place wasn't great. And the place wasn't that famous either. Anyway, it worked. No one cares about how the pizza tasted, especially girls, because because we only ordered from there to check the delivery guy out. As we were talking about the pizza guy, the doorbell rang, and everyone got excited. We went and opened the door, but this time the delivery guy was different. What happened to the other delivery guy? I asked with a disappointed tone, which I guess he sensed it. Sorry to disappoint you ladies, I come in here, but he had another delivery, so I guess you have to bear with me for today. He said with a bittersweet smile on his face, which made us feel embarrassed. Well, I can't say about the others, but I felt embarrassed enough to apologize to him. After saying sorry, I gave him my number out of guilt, and as soon as I closed the door, are you just nice or stupid? Why would you give him your number, even after apologizing? It was Brittany who had said that. Well, I don't know, I guess what I said made him feel bad. So I asked him if I could apologize properly over a cup of coffee or something. I realized my foolishness as I said that, so I shut my mouth after that before anyone else could say something. We enjoyed the slumber party, but after a while we thought that we would give it another try and even order some pizza again. Brittany ordered through her phone and made a special yet bold request by saying that she wanted the hog guy to deliver the pizza. After waiting for 20 minutes or so, the doorbell rang again, and I guessed that the pizza guy was there. I asked Brittany to open the door this time because I did not want to face that guy from earlier. And when she opened the door, it was the hot guy again. We felt relieved and excited. Did you want to come inside and enjoy it with us? It was Brittany who had asked him with a seductive tone. I could tell by his smile that he was already experienced this before. Why not? After all, this is my last delivery for tonight. He smirked and came inside the apartment. The entire night, Brittany was all over him, flirting and making passes on him which made me feel extremely furious. After enjoying the entire night, we all fell asleep. The next morning, I woke up from the loud moaning sounds coming from the bathroom. I went there to check and saw Brittany having hardcore sex with the hot pizza delivery guy. As I told you before, I don't have crushes on anyone that easily. But if I ever do, I get extremely possessive about that. And what made it even worse was that Brittany knew. And she also had a major crush on that hot pizza guy. She saw me watching her enjoy herself in the bathroom and and she gave me a smile that felt the evilest and annoying to me as nothing else. Hey, why don't you just join us in on the fun? As I was about to leave, she called me loudly, which made the hot guy's head turn towards me as well. And at that moment, I felt the most embarrassed, even more than last night. I was feeling a rage that I'd never felt before in my entire life. And it was directed towards Brittany, because I knew that she was doing this on purpose just to make me feel inferior to her. All the other girls had already left my apartment, and Brittany also left after that delivery guy, while giving me a smile, which made me want to destroy her face. The next night, I called Brittany over and asked her to hang out. As soon as she came in, she asked me if she could call the delivery guy again or not. Why not, Brittany? I guess it would be fun. I smiled while saying that. We watched movies and waited for the time when the delivery place was almost about to close, and then placed the delivery for pizza. After a few minutes, a doorbell rang and we went to the door. Brittany was surprised to see that not only was the pizza guy there, but the other one was there as well. What? Don't I get to enjoy like you did yesterday? I laughed and looked directly into her eyes, confused. She could not understand, but... And after a while, she laughed, thinking that I was going to have sex with the other guy while she enjoys the hot one. Why don't we have a foursome with some roleplay? I suggested knowing Brittany would accept it, and as I expected, she agreed. 
I suggested that we all put a blindfold on ourselves, and she did willingly. I could tell how excited she was without knowing what she was about to happen. I asked the Hawkeye to tie her up on the bed tightly, then remove her blindfold, and then leave right after she's turned on. He did exactly as I instructed. Well, he had to because I'd given them both enough money for them to follow my orders. I guess being rich has its perks. Brittany looked confused when she saw her blindfold removed. After that, I removed the clothes of the Hawkeye and had sex with him in front of her. I could tell that she hated watching that. Brittany had a bad habit of oversharing everything, including what she liked, disliked, hated, and I was using that to get back to her. I instructed the other guy to enjoy himself however he wanted with Brittany, and he did. As she was getting raped by the other guy, I was having every type of sex she liked with the hot guy in front of her, in her very own eyes. She was screaming in pain and looked at the evil side of me, which she could not believe because just last night, she remarked on me being nice and foolish. When I was done playing with him like a toy, I asked him to go and do whatever he wanted with Brittany. As he was walking towards her, she looked at him and then at me with a disgusted look on her face. I made them both enjoy themselves with her at the same time. And after I was done with my revenge, I gave them more money and let them go. And you thought you were the evil one with the little stunt you pulled last night? I looked her straight into her eyes, which were filled with tears, and I said while laughing the evilest laugh. Even I was surprised by this side of myself, which I was enjoying at the moment. I freed her and gave her a new set of my clothes to wear. As she was leaving limping, I said with a smirk on my face, why don't we make this our thing? Enjoying the late night pizza delivery. In the late summer of 2013, I landed a position as a trainee at the best motorcycle paint shop in all of North Carolina. Ever since I was around 10 years old, I was obsessed with that show, American Choppers. My older brother was into the mechanical side of things, but to me, the coolest part of the whole process was the paint job, turning these already awesome machines into something that looked like straight up fantasy. I was living with my parents in Martinsville, Virginia when I found out that Gleamer's Motorcycle Painting in Charlotte, North Carolina was advertising what was basically an intern position. For a couple of bucks an hour, I'll help keep the place clean and run smoothly while learning the tricks of the trade in the process. Then. After about a year when I was all trained up, I'd be offered a full-time and fully paid position. I called the guy and practically begged him for the job, told him I'd work harder and smarter than anyone else, twice as hard even. I was dropping the names of renowned bike painters who I thought the best manufacturers were, anything I thought might impress the guy. In the end, he only had one question for me. Harleys or sports bikes? I told him Harleys. He told me, you're hired. Two weeks later, I make my first drive to Charlotte at 6.30 in the morning. Most I'd ever driven before that was to and from Martinsville Taco Bell, and there I was making this two-hour trip at the crack of dawn. Luckily, the trip down there went pretty smooth, and apart from the bathroom break that I took around mile 60, it was a straight shot to Charlotte down the I-85 South. But that first day really took it out of me. It wasn't some Marine Corps boot camp or nothing, but the owner and veteran painters definitely wanted to see what I was made of. The point is, I was dead tired by the time I had to drive back. So as you can probably guess, the journey home wasn't nearly as smooth as the drive out there. When I started seeing signs of Moxville, North Carolina, I realized I must have made a wrong turn back around Salisbury. No big deal. I could just readjust with maybe only a half hour extra on my journey and besides that, I was looking to stop somewhere to pick up some food, as there's no way I could wait for the plate my mom had promised to save for me. I get to a place called Clemens, and I start seeing signs for the highway. There was a Cracker Barrel, a Krispy Kreme, a Biscuitville. Oh man, it was like junk food heaven down there. So I pull off, get a fried pork chop biscuit, then started up my journey again. Only by this point, I'm hopelessly lost. My phone is out of battery and I'm so tired I can't even read the roadmap that I'm forced to be using now sitting on my passenger seat without fear of causing an accident. So, on account of good old southern hospitality, I decided to stop to ask someone for directions. But of all the houses to pull up outside, I pulled up outside 2947 Knob Hill Drive. And little do I know, 
I'm about to have a brush with death where Satan himself has his finger on the trigger. Y'all think I'm exaggerating with that, right? Ain't no such thing as the devil. But in North Carolina, the devil was just as real as I am surely breathing, and his name was Pazuzu. First thing I noticed about this house is that there were these two punk girls sat outside on the front lawn. They were both real cute, sitting there, smoking cigarettes, so I figured, who better to ask? I could start a little conversation, maybe drop that I painted motorcycles for a living, see if I could get a phone number or two. Turns out neither girl was actually from Clemens. They'd come all the way down from Ohio to hang out for a while. That struck me as kind of weird, driving like seven or eight hours just to hang out, but still, I just carried on asking if anyone could point me in the direction of the highway. One of the girls said I was welcome to come inside the house as there had to be at least one person in there who knew, even if they had to find Pazuzu. Pazuzu. I'd never heard that word in my life before that day, and honestly it sounded more like something you'd call a cat than a person. And I don't really pay it no mind as I follow them across the lawn and up the front door of the house. The second thing that strikes me is all the creepy looking decorations on the front door. It was like a Halloween skull in there, weird quotes from movies or books, and a bumper sticker that said, Evil will triumph. It looked like the front door to Hell's Frat House, like a total punk rock crash pad, and at first, let me tell you, I was about it. I mean, I was a little taken aback by the uh, historical German memorabilia, if you get my drift, on the ceiling as I walked inside, but there was all kinds of nonsense that was all over the walls, all sorts of weird symbols, stuff in crazy writing that sort of looked Arabic, I guess you could say. And look at it this way. I knew whoever had drawn it just wanted to be shocking or edgy. It's not like they were a house full of Nazis or whatever. Because that's what I mean about the crash pad thing. The place was filthy and it stunk to high heaven. But as long as I could just get directions and then get out of there, I didn't pay the stink no mind. So, I carried on through the house. This place was just a sensory overload. Because not only does it reek and the decoration is practically schizophrenic, but I can barely hear myself think over the black metal they had blasting. As I walk into the TV room, there's a bunch more people hanging out, smoking and drinking, pentagrams everywhere, all kind of messed up pictures on the wall. One was this really nice framed picture of what looked like a body at a crime scene. Another thing I noticed was a big tank with red lights, like an empty fish tank, and the thing has like a bunch of huge tarantulas in it. That was actually kind of dope now that you mention it. But that's about as good as it got, because the next thing I know, as I'm following these two girls deeper and deeper into the house, the bad smell goes from, dude, you need to clean up, to, did something die in here? The two girls then lead me into the kitchen and through another room with yet another animal habitat in it. Only this time, instead of spiders, the tank was full of snakes. I say full, there were maybe only four or five in there of varying sizes, but dude, I ain't never seen anyone keep no steak as a freaking pet. Where I'm from, that'd be considered downright satanic, and definitely weird. But not only does this house have a tank full of them, but some random dude is sitting on a table with one of them right there in front of him. The girls start talking to this guy, and when he turns... I can see he's in a not-so-fit state to be talking to anyone. His pupils were like little holes in the snow, like this guy was as high as a freaking kite. They called him by a name that I won't even try and repeat here, obviously a nickname, but the thing was just a combo of practically every top-tier curse word you can think of. But this guy was just out of it. And since he was one of the locals that could have helped me, we had to look elsewhere. But just before we left the room, I peered around the guy to see what he had in front of him. Now I can recognize heroin and all the works when I see him. Needle, spoon, all that stuff. But this guy had a little knife there, a small brass cup, and I realized the snake isn't moving. It's not moving because he doesn't have a head, and the contents of his arteries had been drained into this little brass cup. This guy was doing heroin while drinking snake blood. 
and that's about the time I realized this wasn't just some party house. Much creepier stuff entirely was going on in there. So right as I'm shouting, I think I'm just going to try my luck on the road. Over the music, the two girls are like, Nah, we'll get your directions, but we're going to have to go see Pazuzu. I respond, Who's Pazuzu? And in response, one of the girls just laughs. Not like in a, that's a dumb question kind of way, but more like, Oh, you're not going to like it when you find out kind of way. So instantly... I have this knot of apprehension in my gut that's telling me to run away from that house and never, ever look back. But another factor at work was pure curiosity. I'd never seen anything like that house in my entire life. It was surreal in the extreme, the kind of place you'd never believe existed until you actually were in it. Put it this way, you'd think the idea of a corridor would be to allow free movement around a building, but no, in this house, the corridors were like the collective trash can. Me and the girls were literally clambering over freaking broken furniture, old fast food bags, all kinds of nonsense, just to make it to one of the house's bedrooms. One of the doors, I think it led to the bathroom, was literally covered in writing that started off like, if you're reading this, this warning is for you. It went on to say all this stuff about wasting your life, being stuck with an empty life somewhere reading graffiti on a bathroom door, instead of doing anything more fulfilling. I was half lost in it when one of the girls was like, Hey kid, you want your directions or no? And since I wanted nothing more than to be out of there by that point, I was almost gagging from the smell. I wasted no time in following. As it turned out, the room this... Pazuzu character was in was only accessible by passing the entrance to the basement. As I'm scrambling over some of the hallway debris right next to the basement entrance, this wave of rotten stench just overwhelms my nostrils, and I find myself actually retching from it. And not like a quiet little gag that I can at least attempt to hide. I'm talking like a loud, puke, screaming kind of deal. The girls just burst out laughing telling me to man the F up because it's only cat litter or something. Let me assure you, I knew that wasn't just litter. It smelled like their cat had died rather than just taking a poop. I'm still retching as I step into what had to be the filthiest room in the house, which was honestly something of an achievement at that point. But unlike the other rooms where a kind of chaotic untidiness was the general theme, the filth in this room seemed to be cultivated. Most of the floor space was free, but I swear to God, the carpet was so dirty and crusty that it was almost like walking on gravel. That, and there was this patch of black mold on the ceiling that was the worst I've ever seen, even all these years later. It was unreal, and I'm just drinking this all in as I managed to get my retching in control, just in time to lay my eyes on one of the scariest individuals I've ever encountered. This guy had shoulder-length dreads sticking out of what I was pretty sure was a turban, and coupled with all the Arabic writing everywhere, I figured this guy was of some Muslim heritage or something. I didn't know many Muslims with face tattoos though, and I'm pretty sure anybody involved with that culture with the word Satan tattooed on their forearm would probably catch a stink eye or two for that. But as my mama said, the fastest way to offend a host is to talk politics or religion, so I decided to keep any questions to myself. Besides, the only one I was interested in was how to get to the North Carolina-Virginia state line. Right as I was about to ask, one of the girls spoke up for me. Pazuzu, this guy has a question for you. The dude they called Pazuzu had these slow, kind of lazy movements. And as he looked at me behind his shades, I didn't need to see his eyes to know that he too was high as a kite. Sit, was all he said. Uh, I'm good, I remember saying back to him. Because it's dirty? Uh, no, I'm just, my back's been hollering at me is all. Clearly it was a lie that I said, but... My desire not to offend the guy was suddenly waning, 
But, uh, I mean, it smells like someone died out there, dude. Maybe you should, I don't know, clean up a little. This prompted yet more laughter from Pazuzu, the girls lounging around the room as well as the pair I'd followed. But the joke is completely lost on me, like I'm a kid who just said the dumbest thing ever but doesn't realize it yet. Oh. That. Right. The Pazuzu guy said. Don't pay it no mind. There are just the bodies in the basement. More laughter now. The girls are laughing like it's the funniest thing they'd ever heard. Then, the Pazuzu guy spoke again. You know how cleanliness is next to godliness, right? Well, filth is the path to demonhood. All this rot. All this decay. Right then he takes this big sniff of air like it was pure air freshener he was smelling. All this filth. It gives me power. That's when he takes his shades off. And I swear to God, the scariest thing about this guy was his eyes. Even in the low light, I could see that they were pale, like a blue-gray kind of color. I just remember how dead they looked, like they were that color because all the life had been drained out of them or something, and even though he was smiling at me, his eyes had this sad look to them. The longer I stood there, listening to that guy talking all this nonsense, I started getting the impression that I'm not actually safe there. Like, yeah, it was a crazy looking place, but the most dangerous party houses tend to get is the risk of being puked on or something. So I thought. I mean, I've been to party houses before, but I'd never gotten this overwhelming impression that my life was in danger, and not just from picking up a disease from all the gross stuff around the house. Uh, actually, dude, I was hoping I could get some directions back to the highway. My phone died, and I... He cut me off with... You should stay. I think we can use you for something. Use me? Use me? Hearing those words made me freeze up for a moment. The girls around us started nodding and agreeing and stuff. And by this point, I can actually feel the adrenaline kicking in. And that's because I just noticed the 22 rimfire that was leaning on the back of the couch him and his girls were sitting on. Nah, I'm... Good, I... I got work in the morning. I'm already backing up while I'm saying this. In fact, it's getting pretty late as it is. I should probably get going. Thanks anyway, though, and, uh... Cool house. When I turned, I half expected to see one of the girls blocking the doorway like it was some horror movie or something. But thank God it was clear. So I mount the trash pile in the corridor and start heading back towards the front door. Don't you want directions, kid? Even over the blaring music, I could hear one of the girls coming after me. Not chasing or anything, just following. But good God, that was creepy enough as it was. She follows me all the way back to my car, and as I climbed into the passenger seat, I could see that a bunch of people had come out onto the steps to watch me leave. And let me tell you, they did not look happy to see me go. It took me longer than it should, but eventually I find my way back to the highway, and I make it home late, but in one piece. The first thing I do is tell my mom and dad about the absolute insanity I stumbled into on the way home. They'd been pretty worried anyway, and to hear about all the weird devil stuff going on freaked them out. They told me to never go to that little town again, adding they'd give me some extra money for one of those in-car cell phone chargers that fits in the cigarette lighter if it ever came to it. I told a few other people about the house over the months that followed, but I'm pretty sure most people thought that I was just making up stuff. And I get it. It's the kind of thing you gotta see if you're ever gonna believe it. So as crazy as it is, it was all totally forgotten about by around Thanksgiving time. Then, I think just over a year after the whole thing happened, I'm living in an apartment down in Charlotte, working full-time as a painter at the shop. 
I finish work, get home, and start eating my dinner in front of the TV. The news comes on, start talking about some murder or something, and that's when I hear a word that never in a million years did I ever think I'd hear again. Pazuzu. The moment the news lady said it, my head comes up like a deer hearing a twig snap. And when I looked at the TV, I almost spit out the mouthful of short ribs I was chewing on. It was the dreadlock guy with the tattooed face I'd seen the year before, and the one I was pretty sure wasn't kidding when he said he had a body in his basement. There had been a body in the basement, only it wasn't some raccoon that had gotten trapped in a crawl space or something. They'd locked a kid in the basement, starved him, shot him in the head, then covered his body with cat litter and bleach to minimize the smell. Then they showed one of the other people that had been arrested for the murder, and if it wasn't one of the girls with him that appeared on the screen, some blonde girl with no eyebrows who helped him kill the guy, according to the news report. By the time I was able to snap out of the pure shock of seeing all this, I grabbed my phone, called up a buddy of mine, one who rolled his eyes at my story and was like, turn on channel 9, like right now. He sounds all irritated like I just woke him up from a nap or something. Then I hear TV noises in the background. Then he just goes, Oh my sweet mother Mary. Y'all can look this guy up if you want. He had a Christian name when he was younger, but he was going by Pazuzu Algarad by the time he was arrested for murder. Ended up hanging himself in a prison cell I heard. It was a pretty messed up story. But knowing what he meant by, you should stay, we could use you, that's what really haunts me about the whole thing. All I cared about was getting out of there and saving my own self. I didn't stop to think that other people might be in danger. It just seemed like he was crying out for attention, what with all those face tattoos and stuff, but to think he was actually capable of murder. Sometimes I find myself just counting my blessings and thanking God I didn't end up in that basement, covered in cat litter and bleach. Back in 2015, I went to Cologne, Germany for a work trip. I put it in quotes because it was all in the company dime, but all it consisted of were a bunch of team building exercises involving several different offices from around Europe and the US. There'd be go-karting, paintballing, numerous lunch meets, and nights on the town. So although we were there in a professional capacity, it was basically a paid vacation. I was honestly super psyched to be there. It was my first time outside of the US, let alone Europe. So our first night there, I went out with a work buddy of mine, hitting up a few small bars after dinner to sample some German beers. And I do mean sample because, despite what everyone said afterwards, we knew darn well that we couldn't get sauced since we had our first team building activity the following morning. So we're drinking smaller glasses of all the different beers in one place than moving on to the other. These glasses couldn't have been any bigger than 8 ounces or so, and we weren't totally finishing everything. I know it sounds dumb, but even though we were drinking, the aim was to not get drunk. My point is, by the time we got to our third bar, we were basically sober and had told ourselves that that would be our last stop before returning to our hotel. We walked up to the bar, checked out the drinks menu, then ordered two small glasses of Fruli, which turned out to be a bright red strawberry beer. Then as we're talking about how awesome it was, some guy sidles up to us like, Americans? We get talking to him just about where we're from and stuff, and it turned out he wasn't German but had moved there from someplace else when he was a kid. I didn't want to press him on it, as the way he talked made it seem like kind of a touchy subject, so we just moved on to other stuff, like why we were visiting Cologne. It's around then that he started asking if we wanted him to hook us up with any girls. I knew exactly what he meant by that, so I politely refused on mine and my buddy's behalf, laughing it off and assuring him I was married. He moved on to drugs, asking if we wanted hashish or cocaine or ecstasy. Again, I'm like, no thanks, remaining polite, 
But then the guy kind of pauses, looks us both over, and asks me something that shook me to my core. He leans in so the other drinkers wouldn't hear him, and he says in a low voice, It's boys you want, yes? I can get you boys. Very young boys. My buddy was in a mid-sip as the guy said it, and he just about chokes on his fruly as I tell the guy to take a hike. I didn't think he was serious. I thought it was more supposed to come across as an insult or something, but afterwards, I'm not so sure. I think as horrifying as it may seem, he might have actually been able to follow through with that offer. Anyway, like I said, I just told the guy to go kick rocks since he was getting on my nerves. The guy kind of sneers at us, laughs the rebuke off, then walks away, taking a seat with a bunch of guys over in the corner of the bar. Me and my buddy work through our beers, siphon the pythons in the bar's bathroom, then head back towards our hotel room. On the way out, the guys in the corner of the bar are giving us major stink eye, but with me being semi-street smart, I just knew to stick to brightly lit places and try to shake their tail if they tried to follow us. We walk for a few minutes, no one follows us, so I think we're all good. But it's shortly after that that I realized I was actually really, really drunk. It made sense, I know, I'd been drinking, but I was too drunk. Like, way too drunk for the amount I'd actually consumed. Literally, the last thing I remember is saying, Bro, I feel gross. Then there's just nothing. I know we kept walking for a while, but I don't remember where, and I don't remember passing out or seeing those shady guys from the bar again. But given that both me and Buddy woke up a few hours later, just as the sun was starting to rise, and he had been completely rinsed clean of all valuables, I'm willing to hazard a guess as to what happened. All the symptoms we felt the next day were completely consistent with being drugged with GHB or some other kind of sedative. When we reported it to the cops, they had us give urine samples and tested our urine, and lo and behold, they tested positive for some kind of knockout drug. It wasn't specifically GHB, but it was some other long three-word name, but it basically had the same effect and we both felt absolutely terrible for the next whole day. Honestly, it's not the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Like, I know it could have been so much worse, especially if those dudes were as shady as I think they were. But that's just it. I think what they did was kind of a warning. Like a, this is what we're capable of kind of thing. How did they manage to slip something into our drinks? I have zero clue. It must have been when he cleaned it, but... I didn't see a thing. It certainly makes for some impressive sleight of hand and certainly makes it clear that whoever we're dealing with, they were pros. Heck, if they'd really wanted to, they probably could have made us completely disappear. We missed that first team building exercise in the morning of the second full day, go-karting too, which really stunk knowing that we wouldn't be going again. But we had bigger fish to fry, ultra-dangerous criminal fish too. But no matter how detailed of a report we gave or how much we pointed the German cops in the right direction, they came back with nothing. I think the closest we got to a definitive answer was when one cop said that he strongly suspected it being the work of an Albanian group that were known to scam tourists. As soon as the guy said it, both me and my buddy were like, yeah, that sounds about right. The shady guy did say that he was from another country and his unwillingness to talk about it could have been genuine. I know all the ex-Yugoslav countries went to some terrible times in the early 90s, which could well explain why the guy was in Cologne in the first place. Thankfully, we never ran into those guys again, and the rest of the trip was so much fun it pretty much made up for the initial drugging and robbery. But I always let it serve as a reminder that not everyone in a foreign place is some kindly stranger and letting your guard down in a new and unfamiliar place can come with a heavy, heavy price. Caitlin's on Bumble? But why does she need to be on a dating site? Isn't she already in a relationship with Peter? I asked Maya out of curiosity, because it was just the other day when I saw them kissing in an empty classroom. I don't know, maybe they broke up. But I swear that I saw her profile on Bumble, Jade said. 
Caitlin, Jade, Peter, and I were in our final years of high school. Peter and I were childhood friends along with neighbors, and during the first two years of high school, the four of us used to hang out together. But one day, Caitlin decided to seduce Peter, and the two of them started dating together. No, I don't have a crush on him. I never did. It's just that there are certain codes in a friendship, and one of them is that my two best friends are not supposed to date each other, because if they end up breaking up, it would be difficult for me. So I decided to cut them off out of my life completely, and Jade followed me along. It wasn't like my life became miserable after that. It was still serene. However, I missed hanging out with those two. Nevertheless, when Maya told me about Caitlyn being on Bumble, I felt a bit frustrated because this is exactly why I never wanted the two of them together in the first place. Still, Maya told me to keep it under wraps for now and just see what would happen next. I used to give out tuition for middle school kids and the exams were around the corner as well, so I was a bit tied up for the next few days. That was why I could not notice what was going on around me. Neither did it matter that much whether Peter and Caitlin were dating or had broken up because I had already decided that I would never talk to them in my life the day I ended our friendship. It was three days before our exam, and I was in a biology lecture while feeling a bit drowsy when I noticed Peter walking out of class looking all worn out. He was still the person I cared most about since he had been my childhood friend, so it was natural for me to worry about him more than my other friends. I started thinking about what Maya told me about Caitlin being on Bumble, trying to date other people, and downloaded the Bumble app to see for myself. The thing was that I made a fake account to check her, and it was with the name of David, and somehow managed to make it look convincing. The exams had started, and I was still unable to find Caitlin over the Bumble app, so thinking that Maya might have been mistaken, I stopped checking the app. Until one day. It was on the last day of our exams when I had just gotten home after completing it and I was feeling quite relaxed by the fact that it was finally over. So I lay over to my bed and started scrolling through my phone when I opened Bumble to check what was going on over there. That's when I noticed that I was matched with Caitlyn. The picture she had uploaded looked quite old. I remember that I was the one who took it when we went to a party, but this was erased from her phone, so she couldn't put it unless she somehow managed to get this picture back. I decided to keep talking to her to see what kind of conversation she is going to have with me. Strangely, she was the one who was coming at me first and she was thinking that I was the dude in the picture. But the thing that ticked me off most was that the way she was talking and behaving seemed nothing like the Caitlyn I know. Trust me, she was a gorgeous girl whom guys wanted to be with and many girls felt envious of her, so it was clear that this person was also using a fake account with her name to hook up with guys. Now all I could think about was that I had to catch this person red-handed and make him stop this nonsense. I continued chatting and flirting with the person who was using the Caitlyn account, and I tried to ask her out on a date, but no matter how many times I asked, she kept postponing it. One day, all of a sudden, she asked me out on a date herself, which was surprising to me, because she was the one who kept rejecting it first. Nonetheless, we agreed to meet in a nightclub for the date. The nightclub was her idea, and she told me that she would be wearing a black dress with a mask on. The date was for the next day, so I had plenty of time to prepare for it. Firstly, I asked a guy from our school to meet me in the club the next day at the same time that was decided between me and the fake Caitlyn, and the next thing I did was I went to Caitlyn's house for the first time in so long, just to clear things out with myself without revealing anything too. It was because I was still in doubt. After all, you never know if you can be the original Caitlyn. Caitlyn was more than surprised to see me after such a long time that she had tears in her eyes. The Caitlyn in front of me and the Caitlyn on the dating app looked so different that it was clear that was an imposter who made it even clearer was that I was talking to the real Caitlyn. I got a message on Bumble from the fake one. Anyway, 
The next day, I went with the other guy to the bar, and I had already explained the situation to him. That was when I saw Maya walking in toward the counter. Even though she was wearing a mask, I recognized her in an instant. The guy went ahead and approached Maya, and as I was watching her from a distance in a black dress and mask talking to the guy, I remembered that the picture of Caitlyn was taken from Maya's phone. I was the kind of person who always faced everything head on, so I just went ahead and confronted her. Instead of feeling bad, she smiled at me, saying that she wanted to break them up. She said that she always thought of her as a fake person. She hated Caitlyn and wanted to take away everything that she loved. I remembered another incident from the past. It was when Caitlyn was too drunk to walk and fell from stairs when Maya was with her. It was clear to me now whom I should have cut off from my life and who was a toxic friend. I looked at her face with disgust and walked out of the club. Dating is hard. It doesn't matter if you are male or female. It's always hard when you try to engage in dating, and it was just too hard for me. It's not because I'm an unattractive person or anything. Instead, I don't socialize much. Whenever I'm facing a woman, I just don't know what to talk to them about. And for that reason, most people often think of me as a rude person and start avoiding me. Okay, so one day, I was just thinking about the solution to my problem, about how I should date when I can't even talk to any of them, and called my friend Neon. He suggested that I should try talking to them through social media or a dating app, but I did not know how to approach a random stranger on social media. It just felt awkward to me. So I searched on Google for dating apps and installed the first one that popped up, which was Bumble. After installing the app, I opened it and started going through it. As I was swiping, I did not get a match for a few minutes, so I closed it, thinking it was a bad choice to depend on an app for dating. I'm a gamer, so after putting my phone down, I went to play games on my computer and spent a few hours playing. I looked to rest in between and decided to check my phone and inadvertently open the Bumble app, only to find that I had a match with a Latina girl, Maria. She was the one to initiate the conversation between us with a simple hello and then asked how I was doing. I did not find it difficult to answer, so I just replied as I do with any of my guy friends if they would ask me such questions. She then started asking about my hobbies, etc., which I surprisingly liked. It felt good to talk to a girl. I had never once in my life had an actual proper conversation with a female besides my mom. So it felt like quite a new and refreshing experience to me, and I was loving it. After a few days of talking, she asked me if I wanted to meet up for a date. Even though I was hesitant, we still agreed to meet at a little cafe for an evening date. I dressed up in casual attire the next day and went to the cafe for our date. She had already told me what she would be wearing, so I recognized her immediately, sitting in a yellow dress in the corner, wearing a ponytail. She looked prettier than how she looked in her pictures. I approached, and after a normal greeting, sat across the table. We started with a light conversation, and I was still feeling a bit nervous and awkward, but she started talking in a way that made me comfortable, and before you know it, we were chatting like we had known each other for years. About an hour or two passed by, and we decided to move our date to a restaurant for a dinner. She took out her phone and searched for a nearby restaurant, and then we went to the one she chose. As we ordered our meals, we started chatting again. The conversation we were having was so good that we did not notice how the time just went by and two hours had passed. Still, neither of us was really ready to call it a night. Anyway, we decided to order some dessert after the meal and have some drinks while we chit-chat. While we were having a nice conversation, she excused herself, saying she needed to use the restroom. I started waiting for her and using my phone in the meantime. But when she did not come back even after half an hour, I got worried and asked one of the female staff to check on her. As I was talking to the staff, she came back and apologized for being late, 
and when I asked her what took her so long, she said it was her menstruation. She did not have a sanitary pad with her, so she was asking someone for help, and that was why she was so late. Even though she was talking casually about this because it's a natural thing that happens with a woman, I was still feeling embarrassed by it. After that, we decided to call it a day, and I asked if I should drive her home, which she agreed upon. So as we were driving back, we saw a man putting a woman inside a black car and started driving off. It sounds normal, right? But no, it didn't look normal to me. I felt like something was wrong over there because the female looked too drunk to even stand on her own. I wanted to do something, but I had Maria with me and I felt obligated to safely drop her at her apartment. What are you thinking? Follow that damn car! As she said that, I looked at her with surprise, but the moment I saw concern and fear in her eyes for that girl, I followed her advice. We quietly followed that car as it drove out of the town, and I made sure to maintain a safe distance from it so that the man does not notice that he was being followed. As the car reached a place that was surrounded by woods, he stopped the car and stepped out of it. I guess he was out of gas or something, because he checked the car and kicked it in frustration. Then he called someone through his phone, and about 15 or 20 minutes later, another car came and picked them up. Surprisingly, Maria was recording all of this on her phone. I did not question it because we might need it later. So we followed the car and it stopped in front of a huge house. The house was in an abandoned area which doesn't make sense to either of us. Why would a guy take a drunk girl to a secluded place? But we still thought we should wait to see if he is dropping off the girl at her house. As we waited there, an hour passed and those men still did not come out of the house and I did not have the patience to wait anymore. So Maria suggested that we call 911, explain the situation and let's see what they do. And that was exactly what we did. Officers came and started searching the house. Two men with huge builds came out and started threatening the officers to leave. Within minutes, the matter got out of hand and they had to call backup for help. After searching the place, 13 young girls and 7 boys were found, and it turns out there was an entire legal business of human trafficking going on there. Those people used to kidnap girls and boys who were either walking home late or coming out late drunk from a party, or some similar situations, and then take them back to this place. After that, they would be exploited for smuggling, sexual exploitation, or sell them to forced prostitution, etc. I would never be able to forget this date. As I dropped her in front of her apartment building, she said before going inside, Trust me, I was thinking the same thing. Even though this was my first date ever, I think it was completely different and memorable than any normal date. I was scrolling through my phone when I came across an article the mysterious disappearance of the Manic Street Preacher star. I opened the article to read it. It said Ricky Edwards vanished on the 1st of February 1995 and was presumed to have committed suicide. I read the article and got curious, so I googled his name, and then I found out about his mysterious disappearance. Ricky Edwards was a songwriter, musician, and rhythm guitarist of the alternative rock band Manic Street Preachers. He joined the band in 1989 and became the fourth member and spokesman. He had a younger sister, Rachel, and the two of them were very close. His interests were in music and literature. He often used to refer to writers and poets during interviews. His love for poetry reflected through his songwritings. Edward was suffering from severe depression and often talked about it in his interviews. He was often implementing self-harm and used to cut himself and stuff cigarettes on his arms. He said, when I cut myself, I feel so much better. All the things that might have been annoying me suddenly seem so trivial because I'm concentrating on the pain. I'm not a person who can scream and shout, so this is my only outlet. He also had insomnia and a drinking problem. He often used to drink so that he could sleep. Edward was the first person to talk about his depression publicly and inspired his fans to do so. 
his fans started to follow Edwards and started to harm themselves like him, copying him, etc. Caitlin Moran has also stationed in the Times, Edwards became a cause among depressives, alcoholics, anorexics, and self-mutilators because he was the first person in the public's eyes to talk openly about these subjects, not with swagger, bravado, and a subtext of, look how tortured and cool I am, but with humility, sense, and often bleak humor. On the 15th of May, 1991, when he was asked a question by NME journalist Steve Lamont about how serious he was for his art, he carved the words for real into his forearm with a razor blade as his response. On the 1st of February, 1995, Edwards, along with Bradfield, a fellow band member, was supposed to fly to the United States for a promotional tour of the Star Preacher's album, The Holy Bible, which was released in 1994. In the morning of the 1st of February 1995, he was reported missing by his family, and the search began. Edward took his wallet, car keys, and some Prozac and his passport, and checked out of the hotel at 7 a.m., leaving his packed suitcase behind. After he drove to his friend's place in Cardiff, he left his passport, Prozac, and the Servant Bridge tool both received. In the following couple of weeks, he was reported to be spotted by a fan in the Newport Passport Office and at Newport Bus Station who was unaware that Edwards was missing. The night before his disappearance, he gave a book, the novel with cocaine, to a friend, telling her to read the introduction, which followed the details of the author staying in a mental asylum. Investigation continued, and on the 7th of February, a driver reported that he supposedly picked up Edwards from the King's Hotel and drove him around the valleys. Reportedly, the passenger had Cockney accent, which occasionally slipped into Welsh one. He got out at the Severn View service station near Aus South Glockenshire. Edwards Volux Cavalier received a parking ticket on the 14th of February at the Seven View service station, but it was reported abandoned on the 17th of February. Police discovered the car's battery to be dead, along with the photos of his families that were taken before his disappearance. It looked like someone had lived in the car. It was supposed that Edward had jumped out from the Severn Bridge, a known suicide site, but many of his known people claimed that he was not the type to commit suicide. Edwards himself said in 1994, in terms of S-word, that does not enter my mind, and it never has been done in terms of attempts, but I am stronger than that. I might be a weak person, but I can take pain. Reportedly, Edwards was spotted in Goa, India and on the islands of Fertavera and Lanzarote. Apart from those, there have been other alleged sightings of Edwards as well. The investigation continued, but apart from his reported sightings, there were no other evidence to the police. The investigation received a heavy criticism, was also quoted by Simpson Price, far from satisfactory. He said that police should have taken Edwards' mental state into account when they are prioritizing his disappearance. Edwards' family was given the option to declare him legally dead from 2022, but they did not for many years. His status was missing persons until the 23rd of November 2008, when he was announced presumed dead. There were many books that were written based on Edwards' disappearance, such as Rob Jonovic's book, A Version of Reason, The Search for Richie Edwards and the Manic Street Preachers. It was published in 2009. A novel was written by Ben Myers with the name of Richard, a novel, which was published on the 1st of October, 2010. Another book published in 2019 with the consent of Edward's sister, which was written by Sarah Hawes by the name of Withdrawn Trace, Searching for the Truth About Ricky Manick. That book claimed evidences that Edward staged his own disappearance. After reading about Edwards, I opened one of his songs, Stay Beautiful, and started listening to it. And while I was listening to the song, many questions started to rise. What really happened to him? Did Edwards really commit suicide, or was he so fed up by the fame and that industry that he wanted to live a peaceful life somewhere else? Did he really stage his disappearance, and if someone killed him and they forged all those sightings of him, what was the real reason behind his disappearance? As I was thinking all these questions with my eyes closed, I fell asleep without even noticing. 
encounter with a criminal. After searching for a long time, I finally landed a part-time job during the first year of law school. I thought I'd be able to pay my rent on my own now, and they were providing meals for the employees, so I didn't have to worry about that. Moving out isn't as cool as it sounds. It's really hard to survive out there in this brutal world. I learned my lesson on the first day of my job as a pizza delivery guy. After weeks of training, the pizza outlet I was working at decided to send me on a delivery assignment. It was the weekend, and the place is usually a lot more crowded on the weekends. Someone had ordered 13 pizzas from a place that was around 2 kilometers from the pizza outlet. One of my co-workers, Beatrice, said, Looks like someone's going to have fun on the weekend, unlike us, part-timers. To which I replied, It's better this way since I'll be getting bored at home anyways. Beatrice told me to be careful and smile while talking to the customers. I took the pizza packages and put them in the delivery vehicle. Pizza delivery bikes are built differently. It has a cubicle box in the backseat area, which is used to keep pizza cartons to make them deliver safely. I opened the location app and took the less traffic route. After 25 minutes, I reached the location and I was stunned to see a big, beautiful house. There was a huge gate and a lot of flowers near the gate. I stepped down from my bike and went over to ring the intercom bell. As I was about to press the button, the gates opened and a man came out. He looked at me and then looked the other way in a very strange manner. But I said to him, Sir, this is your paid for order for 13 pizzas under the name of Michael. I tried to smile. I kept waiting for his response, but instead of saying anything, he signaled me to go in. I acted nonchalant and went inside with the pizza boxes. When I entered the house, it had a whole different vibe. There was a bar attached to the living room. There were lots of men and women drinking alcohol and dancing. Loud music was playing on the speakers, so nobody was able to hear me. After shouting two or three times amid the loud music, I decided to put the pizza boxes on the table near the bar and then go back. When I turned back after putting down the pizza boxes, a pretty woman came and grabbed me. She said, care to join us? I was flustered and irritated at the same time, and I said to her, no ma'am, I'm a delivery boy. I only came here to deliver the pizzas. She laughed and grabbed my arms tightly and started to walk towards the bar. I said to her, ma'am, you look drunk, please let go of my arm. But she didn't listen. I tried to forcefully remove my arm from her grip, and I didn't realize that the music had stopped and everyone was looking at me for being weird and an outsider. That's what I thought before I realized that they were not looking at me, but at the man behind me. A tall man in a white suit came forward and said, What's the problem here? I said, Sir, I'm just a pizza delivery boy and this lady won't let me go. He had a calm demeanor and seemed rich, judging by his clothes and watch. He said, Let the kid go, Lena. The expression on the woman's face changed, she looked scared, and she immediately dropped my hand. I turned back to leave, but then the rich-looking man called me back and saying, On second thought, I think you should stay. Have a drink, maybe. For some reason, I felt a chill in my body. I couldn't deny him. Sir, I will lose my job if I don't go back soon, I said hesitantly. After a short pause, he said, How about I make you an offer? I'll pay you to triple your salary for one job. What do you think, young man? He added. I nodded yes without making a sound. The woman named Lena took me to a room and then gave me a box and a piece of paper with an address written over it. The tall man was gone by then and another rough looking like man came and asked me for my bank details. I gave him my details and walked out with the box in my hand. My message tone beeped, I put the box on the ground and opened the text. It said that $1,000 had been credited to my account. That's when it hit me. My entire body started to shake and tears started to stream out of my eyes. I was afraid to look at what was inside the box so I picked it up quickly and put it in the cubicle box on my delivery bike. As I looked at my hands, they were wet with blood. I threw up on the spot and my heartbeat and breathing was just getting faster. Without taking the bike or my phone with me, I ran and just kept running. After a few minutes, I started to hyperventilate and fainted just there on the ground. When I came to my senses, I saw an old man holding a water bottle. He probably tried to help me while I was laying unconscious on the ground. He was asking me questions or maybe telling me something. I couldn't focus on a word he said, and I took the water bottle from his hands. And just after a few minutes after pouring the water on my head, I asked him where I was and where the nearest bus stop was. The old man told me that it was just 200 meters away, so I thanked him for his help. I went over to the bus stop and took a bus to go home. My phone and delivery bike were never found, and I got fired from my job, and then I also had to compensate for the bike. Five years later, I'm now working as a lawyer.
and I'm always aware of all sorts of criminal activities happening around me, as well as trying to bring justice to evil and good. I never talked about the incident to anyone, but I know that if I ever face the devil, I will not shake anymore. No, I want to go hiking, Derek insisted. Just shut up and pack your swimsuits, Gabriella responded in annoyance. But mom, we will be going there by bus. Isn't it better to go on a hiking trip this year? He said while trying to convince her. You know why we do this every year, right? She looked at him and asked while hoping he would stop being unreasonable. Why should we do this? It's the dad who killed her. Derek mumbled in a frustrated tone which Gabrielle and me both heard. Derek, if you cannot go with us, then you won't go anywhere. Go to your room right now. She scolded while smacking him on his back, and he stomped upstairs in response. Don't be harsh on him, honey. I think I'll go there by myself this year, I said with a defeated tone who was watching the entire time. No, you know we'll be together to support you, no matter what, right? She came closer and wrapped her arms around my neck while saying this. I nodded. Around eight years ago, I used to live in an old house that my grandma left for me near the beach. The house was pretty old, and it needed regular maintenance, so I was doing just that. One day, I woke up in the middle of the night and I could not sleep after that, so I decided to take a walk and get some fresh air. I drank some water grabbed my jacket, and went outside the house. As I was walking, I went near the beach. That was when I noticed a girl wearing a white dress was sitting on the opposite side of the beach. I could not see her face. All I could notice was her long black hair, along with the white dress that she was wearing. Water was washing off her feet and half of her body seemed wet. I thought, she may be depressed or something and that must be the reason for her being here at this hour. So I did not think much of it at the time and went back to walking for a few minutes. The next day, I called my fiance Gabriella and talked with her for hours. Gabriella and I were dating for almost five years now and I had recently proposed to her. She was also pregnant with my child at the time and I was in love with her more than ever. After talking to her for about an hour or so, I got ready for work and headed out. As I was passing through the beach, the scene from last night flashed through my mind. The same night I was drinking alone around midnight when I saw from the entrance that the same girl walked toward the same spot that she was sitting last night when she sat there. Maybe she just recently went through a breakup or something. That's what I thought then. As I was drinking, I stared at her, who was just sitting still, staring at the ocean for hours. But I soon got tired and started feeling sleepy, so I went to my bed. I continued my routine as always, and after waking up, I first texted Gabrielle good morning, took a shower after that, and got ready for work. I went down to the kitchen while dialing her number and started making eggs. Morning, honey. What are you up to? she said as soon as she answered the phone. Missing my love in my arms, I said playfully, and she chuckled in response. After that, I talked to her while making and then eating breakfast. I told her about the girl in the white dress that I kept seeing for the last two days. Be careful, she might be a lost spirit or something, she said in a serious tone, which made me pause for a few seconds, but then she burst into laughter. You scared me, I said, taking a deep sigh of relief. Don't worry, maybe she's going through something. Just don't pay much attention. And if you're curious, just ask her if anything is troubling the girl, she said in a chill tone. No thanks, I don't want to approach a possible ghost, I said, and we both started to laugh. After that, I kept noticing for a few days her sitting there and staring at the ocean while the waves wash off at her feet, making her half-body wet in the process. From her appearance, she seemed in her early 20s, but I could never see her face. One day when I was talking to my fiancé, she asked, It's been almost a month, is she still doing that? I told her that she was, 
so she said that maybe the girl needed help and suggested I offer help. I was thinking the same for the past couple of days, so I agreed. Later that night when I saw the girl sitting there, I walked closer to her and stood behind her. I called out for her, but she did not respond. I walked a bit more closely and asked if everything was okay. She turned her head toward me. Her lips looked chapped and there were huge dark circles under her eyes. It made me scared for a few seconds. Then I shook my head and asked again if she needed any help. She kept staring at me without saying anything. I thought it was a waste of time and turned to leave. That was when someone grabbed my legs all of a sudden and started pulling me into the water. I turned and saw that it was her. She had a completely blank expression on her face, as if she did not have any emotion at all, which scared me even more. At this point, I was sure that this was no human, but a ghost, because as she grabbed my legs, I could feel her long nails piercing into my skin. I kicked with all my might and tried to run, but she again grabbed me into the water. But I was so terrified that as a protective response, I strangled her and left her in the water. After that, I ran panting in my house and called Gabriella to tell her everything that happened. She asked me to calm down, saying if it's really a ghost, I did not kill an actual person. The next day, I saw many people and police officers gathered around near the beach. As I was panicking, someone rang the doorbell. I opened it hesitantly and saw that it was Gabrielle at the door. I started crying and she just held me while telling me that everything would be okay. I went ahead and confessed everything to the police officers about what happened that night. They told me that the girl's name was Sarah and the reason she may have done that was that she had a mental condition along with severe trauma for men. Sarah was harassed and physically abused by her uncle and his sons from a very young age until she was rescued by a women's organization. But as a result, she developed a mental condition. I was sentenced to jail, but they released me early since what I did was due to self-defense. I was released from prison two years ago, and ever since then, I went to the beach every year to put flowers on the grave of the person I killed. How about we go hiking next week? I entered Derek's room and said. His face lit up, but then suddenly he looked at me with an apologetic reaction. Sorry dad for saying rude things earlier. I smiled and hugged him. After that, we took our stuff and headed out. I kissed her while looking at her with extreme love in my eyes. As we were heading to the beach, I was thinking that I was thankful to Gabriella for waiting for me and always standing beside me. Have you heard that Manny has girl hobbies? As I was about to enter the class, I heard Steven's voice. He was making fun of me with other students. Is there addition to his weird girly name? Carlos said laughing out loud. The other day, my sister saw him doing makeup in a beauty parlor. Here, she sent me a picture of it too. He took out his phone after saying that and showed it to the entire class. They all burst into laughter and started making fun of me. I clenched my fists and helplessly stood there listening to their nonsense. But then, within a mere few minutes, I couldn't stand it any longer and made my way to the library. My name is Manny Swan. I'm well aware of the fact that my parents did not put much thought while naming me, but I was never ashamed of it. My hobbies and interests never matched with other boys either, so I have been getting bullied from them ever since I was a child. You may think that it may have gotten better by now, or I may have gotten used to it, but no, it never gets easier. Manny, you're here again? Did something happen? It was the librarian. I shook my head no and went into the corner to study. One thing that is good about all of it is that even though I don't attend many classes, I still get top grades in my class. The reason is that to avoid those who bullied me, I spent most of my time in the library studying, therefore the top grades. Looking at my performance, teachers also don't say a word, even though they know what I suffer in class. 
After spending almost all of my time in school in the library, I decided to attend the last class, which happened to be chemistry. It was my favorite subject, taught by one of the strictest teachers in the school, Mr. Adamson. The moment I entered the class, murmurs and snickers started about my name, my part-time work, and my gender itself. But it was soon followed by an absolute silence as Mr. Adamson entered after me. I quietly walked toward the back and took one of the empty seats. I could see Steven's disappointed face because he could not bully me properly this time. We were supposed to submit our assignments today, so after submitting that, the teacher started to explain some theories and then told us that in the next class we would be going to the lab for experiments. Mr. Adamson called me out to carry the assignments with him to the teacher's office, so I followed him. I don't know why, and even though he never says anything apart from matters related to his class or discipline, I get the feeling that he helps me out. The two of us walk quietly to the teacher's room, and after placing the assignments as per his instruction, I left. I had my part-time work right after school, so I headed that way. Every other day, I blocked all these negative emotions and thoughts that come to my mind, but for some reason, I couldn't do that today as it came rushing over my brain. The following day, as I was skillfully applying makeup on one of the customers, I overheard two women talking that I might be gay. The rest of my time, I spent trying to focus on my work, but I couldn't shake this one doubt from the back of my mind that it occurred because of all of these people. What if I was gay? Was there a way to find out? As I was exiting the parlor with all these thoughts, I bumped into a guy, and because of that, his phone fell on the ground. I picked it up while apologizing, and as I handed it to him, I couldn't help but notice an app that had opened on his phone, Grinder. I had heard about it before, but never thought much about it. But for some reason, today, I was thinking that it just might be the right solution for me. Walking back home, I couldn't stop thinking about the app. It was because this app is specifically designed for the LGBTQ+, but I never thought I would be the one using it someday. But to clear all these doubts, I had to use it. So I installed it and created an account for myself, and within less than an hour, I was matched with an Asian American guy named Shin. We talked about our hobbies and interests, and surprisingly, they matched to an unbelievable level. I did not want to accept it, but I had started to think that I might be gay, and that is why when he asked to meet me at a motel, I accepted it. It did not feel good thinking about me being with a guy and performing sexual stuff together, but if I wanted to be 100% sure about this, I had to go. We were supposed to meet the following night around 9 p.m., and I was extremely nervous about it. Still, I got ready, and hesitantly headed to the destination that would be deciding the rest of my life for me. The more distance between the motel and me was closing, the more my chest was feeling tight. I was nervous, terrified, and on the verge of tears that I was doing this. At one time, I was just about to turn back, but then I remembered all the bullying and beating I had endured all these years, and I owed it to myself to know the truth. After reaching the motel, I walked to the room that was booked under the name of Shin with heavy footsteps. He was tall, fair guy with a nice build, but for some reason, I did not find myself romantically attracted to him. For a few minutes, we had some random conversation, but then he suddenly kissed me out of the blue. I don't want to exaggerate it, but I had never felt more disgusted by something. I pulled away, and as he was removing my clothes, I stopped him and apologized. Instead of lashing out at me or cussing me, he calmly asked me the reason for my behavior. I explained everything to him, and from the looks of it, he understood what I may have been going through because of his similar experiences. Before saying goodbye, he advised me never to let anyone else get under my skin and get through to me. I decided to walk to my apartment because a heavy burden and doubt had been lifted from my chest. As I was walking back, it suddenly started to rain and I got soaked within minutes. It was not the realization of being straight that made me feel at ease. Instead, it was the determination 
that I would follow my passion without letting others hinder my path. It was the first time in those past years that I attended all of my lectures sitting in the class without getting bothered by those dogs barking and hyenas laughing around me. And it was the first night I slept like a baby who had nothing to worry about anymore. I'm feeling tired and sleepy. I need coffee. For me, working without coffee is impossible. I always say coffee is my drug, and my favorite coffee place is Starbucks. Speaking of coffee, I remember witnessing a weird incident that occurred last year at Starbucks. A woman was convicted of drug trafficking. She didn't look like someone capable of committing such a crime. But we should never judge a book by its cover. My name is Laurel Smith. I'm 23 years old, and I work as a journalist in Michigan. While working as a journalist, I was assigned to interview the football team. So I went to the football tournament stadium and gathered as much information as I could get. After that, I began to take interviews, and there was one player who was trying to flirt with me. During the interview, I tried to avoid his cheesy answers, although his answers were funny, I didn't laugh. After finishing the interview, he came to me and asked me for coffee. He was good looking, so I accepted the offer. His name was Andrew. He was tall and handsome. We decided to meet the next day at Starbucks and also exchange numbers. I had an ulterior motive behind it. I wanted to get an inside scoop on the football game. The next morning, Andrew texted me and asked me about the meeting time. I told him we'll meet during my lunch hour at Starbucks near my office, so I went there at lunchtime, but Andrew wasn't there yet. I waited for him for a while, and when he didn't show up, I decided to go back. While I was leaving the cafe, I saw him standing with a woman. It made me furious for some reason. So I went toward him and said, this was a sick idea of a prank. Andrew was startled to see me, and he looked like he didn't understand why I was behaving like that. Honestly, I didn't either. I went back to the office without eating lunch. After around 30 minutes, I was called to my team leader's cabin. My team leader said that a football star is asking around for me. I was shocked to hear that. My team leader assessed the situation perfectly and told me to use this opportunity to get close to the player. He told me to get an exclusive interview with Andrew. Andrew was the ace of the football team and a star player. He was like a celebrity. I went back to my cabin and called Andrew to apologize for my behavior. He told me he would only forgive me if I agreed to go on another coffee date. I told him to meet me on the weekend. On the weekend, we met at the same Starbucks. This time, he came before me and had ordered my favorite coffee, which was shocking and creepy. So I asked him, how did you find out about my favorite coffee? He pointed towards his phone. I was confused. He looked at me and said, I stalked your Instagram account. Then he took a pause and laughed. I was still confused. After chatting for a little while, I felt the need to use the restroom. I told Andrew that I was going to the restroom, and I went there. After I returned, I saw a woman sitting in front of Andrew. It was the same woman from that day. Andrew still hadn't explained himself for that day, and now this again? This time, instead of walking away, I decided to confront them. I went ahead and asked Andrew, what's this about? He replied, before you misunderstand, I want you to calm down and listen first. Without saying anything, I sat there and started to listen. Andrew told me that the woman's name was Betty. She was homeless and a single mother. She needed funds to raise her child, so he decided to donate money to her. Judging by her appearance, it wasn't hard to believe that she was not very well off. After explaining the situation to me, the woman thanked Andrew for giving her a check. Andrew apologized to me and told me not to share this with anyone. I felt bad for doubting him. So I asked him to meet next week, but he told me that he won't be able to meet next week because of a semi-final match. He dropped me home after that. 
we became friends and he shared some spicy stories about the football team. I was happy to get the scoop that I wanted and I began to like Andrew. After his semi-final match, we met at Starbucks. His team had won and was going to the final tournament. I was happy for him. There were several articles about Andrew, and one of the argues was about him dating me. It was written by my colleague Sasha. Everyone was teasing me at my workplace. I was happy on the inside, but acted as if it made me angry. A day before Andrew's final match, we met at the same Starbucks. Andrew told me that he liked me and asked me to watch the football game the next day. When I went to the stadium, I looked for Andrew everywhere, but he was nowhere to be found. The coach told me he was not picking up his phone, so he had sent someone to pick him up from his home. The match was about to begin. The rival team was already there, and the announcer was calling the names of the players. Everyone else was present except for Andrew. Sasha called me and told me to go to the police station. When I reached there, I found out that Andrew had been arrested for driving after taking drugs. This was a big shock for me. I asked him what happened. He said that someone spiked his coffee at Starbucks. I asked him to tell me the details. He told me that he went to Starbucks before going to the stadium and there he met Betty and gave her another check for donation. Then he took his coffee and returned to his car. I figured out what was going on, so I told the police about Betty. After investigation, the police found out that Betty was indeed a drug trafficker. Andrew got released and Betty got arrested for drug trafficking and spiking his coffee. Andrew did not get to play in the final match. His innocence was proven so he was allowed to continue his athletic career. I got a big scoop and got promoted. After that day, I never talked to Andrew, nor did he try to contact me again. I knew what happened, but kept quiet. Andrew was never making donations. Betty was his drug dealer all along. Born on January 17th of 1991, Lauren Spear was the daughter of Charlene and Robert, an accountancy couple from Scarsdale, New York. After graduating from Edgemont High School in 2009, Lauren enrolled at Indiana University. She was an active and good-natured young student and volunteered for many charitable causes. For example, she had spent the previous spring break planting trees in Israel on behalf of the Jewish National Fund combining her two passions of travel and public service. As you can imagine, Lauren's attitude made her a very popular young woman, and her circle of friends seems to have been a consistent and positive one. You see, Lauren had met her college boyfriend, Jesse Wolf, as well as her best friend, Jay Rosenbaum, during a summer camp in the hillside town of Honesdale, PA, and a handful of her other close friends at Indiana University had also attended the summer camp. The point is, it seemed that Lauren was part of a tight-knit unit of friends who both loved and trusted one another, which makes it all the more alarming when we learn what happened to her. On the night of Thursday, June 2nd, 2011, Lauren and her friends visited the nearby Kilroy Sports Bar. In an effort to save on what little cash they had, Lauren and her friends partook in what's known as pre-gaming where people drink store-bought alcohol before going out to a bar or club. The group of friends were also notorious for only venturing out into the night during the wee small hours. Kilroy's also catered to this kind of crowd, keeping their bar open until 4 in the morning, and CCTV footage from that night doesn't show Lauren and her friends arriving until about 1.46am. For the first 45 minutes or so, everything appears relatively normal. Lauren and her friends have drinks, they dance, they play pool, everything you might expect from a group of college kids soaking up the nightlife. But then, around 2.27 in the morning, Lauren's behavior takes a somewhat bizarre turn. It's around then that Lauren gets up and walks out of the bar, leaving her cell phone on the bar top and her shoes on the floor near her seat. After exiting Kilroy's, she is then quickly followed by a friend named Corey Rossman. 
Rossman seems confused as to why Lauren left her things behind, but seems only too happy to follow her back to her apartment complex. At exactly 2.30 a.m., Corey and Lauren enter the small wood plaza apartments complex that Laura called home. It's here they remain for exactly 28 minutes before CCTV once again captures them leaving the apartment complex. Only instead of walking back to the bar, where Lauren's phone and shoes are still sitting there, Lauren and Corey walk down an alleyway that connects College Avenue and Morton Street, the same alley where Lauren's purse and apartment keys would be found the following day. CCTV footage then catches Lauren and Corey arriving at the latter's apartment at around 3 in the morning. This footage shows Lauren to be a little worse for wear, but Corey Rossman is somehow absolutely trashed by this point. Corey's roommate, Michael Beth, later said that he had to clean up a puddle of vomit that Corey left in the stairwell that same night, and that Corey was so drunk that he had to be put to bed. Michael added that once this was done, he then tried to persuade Lauren to sleep over for her own safety. However, Lauren insisted that she wanted to return to her own apartment, probably citing her need to find her missing possessions. And so at 3.30 a.m., Michael Beth called Lauren's friend Jay Rosenbaum, telling him he needed to come take care of her. We can only assume he answered in the affirmative because a short while later, Lauren shows up at Jay's apartment with a rather large bruise under her eye. Jay later said that he was worried about the injury, but after Lauren told him she didn't know how she obtained the bruise, Jay assumed she'd gotten it during a drunken fall from earlier in the evening. However, of all the CCTV footage we have of Lauren and her friends, there are no recorded incidents of falling, and no recorded incidences of people fussing over her eye, which we could then use to estimate the time and place of such an injury. By 4.30 a.m., Lauren hasn't had an alcoholic drink in over two hours and is no doubt beginning to sober up. Granted, she wouldn't have been in the best condition of her life, but she is no doubt realizing that she's lost pretty much everything she brought out with her, being her phone, keys, shoes, and purse. In light of this, we can understand why Lauren was reluctant to sleep it off when she could actively go about recovering some of her lost items. Lauren then left Jay Rosenbaum's apartment at around 4.30 that morning, last being sighted on CCTV footage headed south from the intersection of 11th Street and College Avenue. Several hours later, Lauren's boyfriend, Jesse Wolf, sent her a text which she failed to reply to, and when reply did finally roll in, it was from an employee of Kilroy Sports Bar, saying Lauren had left her phone there overnight. Not long after... Given he had zero means of getting in touch with her, no one had seen her that morning. Jesse contacted the local campus police to report Lauren missing. After three weeks of fruitless search, August of 2011 saw local police and FBI agents undertake a week-long search of the nearby Sycamore Ridge landfill site. Needless to say, it wasn't looking good for Lauren, as cops were evidently looking for a body, or more accurately, parts of a body as opposed to a living, breathing person. But despite their efforts, law enforcement didn't manage to find a single shred of evidence that clued them into Lauren's condition or where she might be. The investigation dragged on for years without a break, and this is in spite of more than 3,000 tips called in from the general public. Then, on the morning of April 25, 2015, a hint of Lauren's fate was unearthed not far from where she went missing, yet it goes without saying that it was not a good one. The lifeless corpse of a University of Indiana student, Hannah Wilson, was discovered in neighboring Brown County. She was last seen getting into a taxi in front of the very same bar that Lauren had visited on the night of her disappearance. Lying on the ground near her body was a cell phone, one that police determined was owned by a local 50-year-old man by the name of Daniel Messel. He was arrested, tried, and convicted of Hannah's murder, and police deduced that he might well be the same person responsible for Lauren Spearer's disappearance too. However, in July of that same year, nationally renowned private investigator Bo Deedle concluded that after his own extensive investigation, he'd found nothing to seriously link Hannah's murder to Lauren's apparent abduction, and any similarities were purely coincidental. Yet right when it seemed that all hope was lost, 
The winter that followed Hannah Wilson's murder saw the FBI pursue its first serious lead. In the early hours of January 28, 2016, FBI agents were assisted by local law enforcement in serving a search warrant to a property in the 2900 block of Old Morgantown Road in Martinsville, approximately 20 miles north of Bloomington. The rather dry official statement from law enforcement was that they were following up on leads and tips in Morgan County regarding the disappearance of Lauren Spearer. But in reality, they had strong suspicions that a man named Justin Wagers was responsible for her murder or abduction. Wagers, who lived with his mother and stepfather, had been named and identified on multiple occasions as having exposed himself to local women during incidents that were characterized by aggressive and generally terrifying displays of depravity. Cops let cadaver dogs loose in the Wagers' home and found that they indicated for human remains in a nearby barn. However, after conducting a dig and sifting dirt from the floor of the structure, investigators found zero evidence of anyone having been buried there. As the years went by, Lauren's parents sadly announced that they believed their daughter to be deceased. Yet they've also been very open about their suspicions that someone very close to her may have been involved in her disappearance. Not only have they wondered aloud if someone might have slipped something in her drink while she was at Kilroy's, they also had no qualms with casting suspicion on the men she was with that night. Lauren's boyfriend at the time, Jesse Wolf, has also professed his distrust of Corey Rossman, Michael Beth, and Jay Rosenbaum, as not only did all three refuse to take police-issued polygraph tests, but all three lawyered up in the days following her disappearance, apparently completely unprompted to do so, as she was still considered very much alive at that time. Rossman, Beth, and Rosenbaum then publicly stated that they had passed privately administered polygraph tests, which apparently proved their innocence. They were also completely unapologetic regarding them hiring attorneys, and stated that their refusal to cooperate with Bloomington police was down to them not trusting law enforcement. A theory was batted around that Lauren may have died as a result of a drug overdose, one resulting from narcotics obtained from either Rossman, Beth, or Rosenbaum. If that was the case, it's plausible that all three or a combination of the men could have conspired to dispose of her body so that their guilt would never be suspected. Obviously, hiring lawyers and refusing to take a polygraph doesn't exactly make the three guys look good. But in all fairness, it's highly inadvisable to talk to police officers without a lawyer present especially since all three guys knew well their friend was missing. What's more, polygraphs are so unreliable that they're no longer admissible in court, and the police were most likely just looking to get the three guys in an interview room so they could browbeat them into incriminating themselves. So, in light of that, we have to consider other options. But having exhausted the possibilities of either Daniel Messel or Justin Wager having killed her, Time and time again we're forced to consider the accidental overdose angle. I truly don't think it was a random abduction. I think that somebody that Lauren knew was responsible for the events of that evening, her mother publicly stated in 2014, and she may well be correct. Statistically, most people are murdered by someone they know, sometimes pretty intimately too, and it doesn't seem out of the question that those three young men with big bright futures ahead of them wouldn't want to throw them away by admitting they'd given a girl too much to drink or too much of something a little less than legal. So as much as people focus on stranger danger, or of that random creeper who becomes the source of their untimely demise, maybe people should start looking a little closer to home, to those who profess to love or care for us, who might actually disappear us, dispose of our body, or bury our names, just to protect themselves. I used to get bullied, and so did pretty much all of my friends. I witnessed some of it, and I couldn't believe how cruel and degrading people could be. One day, while talking to my friend Sally, who is my best friend, she brought up a boy she had made friends with in conversation. We were on holiday at the time, and I already knew this kid. He was quite pretty smart awkward and very clearly sad. 
She explained how he got bullied because of his voice and how his ex-girlfriend was spreading rumors that he was faking his condition and that he didn't really sound like that. She wanted to know if she could let him sit with us at lunch because he usually didn't have anyone to sit with. I obviously agreed to it, not really knowing that much about him. I hadn't spoken to him a couple of times and he seemed pretty happy about having someone to talk to. But I couldn't see any personality within him. Everything he did just seemed odd, like it wasn't really him. I know that sounds weird, but that's how I felt. His name was Samuel. An unusual name, but quite nice. He seemed like a kind person, but he still carried a weird vibe. After a while of talking to him, Sally and I got to know him better. He liked dark humor much like me, and he was really into Doctor Who. None of us really knew much about it, but we still let him talk about his interests so that he could feel more comfortable around us. He talks a lot and I didn't even realize he had feelings for Sally until he asked me if she liked Harry Potter and what her favorite colors were. She soon realized this too, but was still getting over her ex-boyfriend, so she made it clear that she wasn't interested. But he wouldn't leave her alone. He was always next to her or somewhere nearby, and it started to get to her, and she hated it. She felt as though she couldn't be alone, so I tried to do something about it. I wanted to help, so I turned his attention from her to me. I started hanging out with him more, often listening to his terrible, unphony jokes, to his strange interests, and to everything he said. I tried to make it seem like I wanted to be there, even though at this point, I really didn't. I wanted to get away from him, though and he was beginning to tire me out emotionally with him constantly being there. He wouldn't leave me alone and wouldn't even walk home with me and my friend Grace despite the fact that he lives in the opposite direction. At one point, I was going through a particularly hard time and being desperate for help and someone to talk to. I turned to him. I know it was the wrong move, but desperation led me to him. He asked a video call, so I agreed. I was crying, and he tried to calm me down, eventually succeeding, and just started making his horrible jokes and talking about things I like and stuff. He actually shouldn't have known about, but I didn't think much of it at the time, because I just wanted someone to make me laugh. Laughter got me through a lot of hard times, and I began to think he wasn't so bad after all. I started talking to him through video almost every day after school, and I noticed him being around even more often. Then one day, he said he needed to tell me something, which turned out to be a confession. He confessed that he had a crush on me. But I had to go because my mom wanted to watch a movie with me when I got home. I had about 10 video and voice messages from him, all of them of him apologizing because he'd apparently thought I hadn't actually left to go watch a movie but was instead avoiding him because of what he told me. I felt horrible. I didn't mean to upset him, and he was crying. I explained that I really did go to watch a movie, and that's why I had left fortunately he understood. After a while of hanging out with him, I began to get tired of him again with him constantly being there, and now also knowing that he had a crush on me. I thought back to the situation with Sally, and began to spot the same things in our friendship. He got clingy and just damn right annoying. So I politely explained to him that I didn't want to sit with him at lunch anymore. He still insisted that I sit with him, but I declined, and just told him to go away every time he approached our table. One particular incident, though, made me lose all respect for him. He would sometimes randomly walk with me and Grace, as I mentioned before. I often stayed at her house after school, and we would watch weird videos we'd found in her recommended feed, when about an hour later we heard a knock at the door. She went to answer, thinking it was her parents. But needless to say, it wasn't. It was Samuel. 
I heard his voice and dropped to the floor, hoping he hadn't seen me after a long while of silence. I proceeded to army crawl over to the door to see if he was still there. I'm lost. I can't find my house. Can you guys help me? He asked. Liar. How could he possibly not know where his house is? And it's not like I knew where it was either. I'd never been there. He persisted and continued to knock on Grace's door. She was hiding in the living room, and we came to the decision that we would hide in the conservatory until he went away. So that's what we did. Some time passed before Grace chose to climb onto the desk and see if it was still there. She turned to look at me and pointed in the direction that she was looking. He's still there. He was looking directly at me. He waved at me. She whispered this couldn't be happening. This wasn't happening. We weren't trapped by him. He wasn't outside. This is all a joke or something, but Grace's face looked so scared and in way angry. I awkwardly got my stuff and told her I was going to head out to get him the hell away from her house. She reluctantly agreed, and I left with him. I offered to walk him down to the shop and let him go from there, but he refused to let me leave. He told me he couldn't see very well and that he'd almost gotten hit by a car earlier. Complete BS. This boy had boasted many times about how good his eyesight was, so there was no way he suddenly couldn't see despite his apparent sight problems. He flawlessly led me to his house at this point. I was in an area completely unknown to me, and I began to worry how I would get home. It was already dark, and there was no way I was going to wander an area I had never been in, especially in the dark. Who knows what kind of creeps would have been hiding out there. I brought this up to him, and he assured me that his mom would drop me off, but I didn't want that. I didn't want him to know where I lived with how he was acting. I was fully convinced he would try to pull something. I suffer from symptoms of schizophrenia, and this didn't at all make it better for me. I felt unbelievably unsafe at that moment and wished that I hadn't left Grace's countless minutes dragged on as I sat and waited in his room, surrounded by his cats. They were the only thing keeping me from snapping. After they dropped me off in my house, I went to my mom and broke out in tears. I couldn't take it anymore. He'd gone too far this time. So my mom said she was going to report him for it. Because he wasn't going to cause me this much stress and get away with it. I agreed at the time, but soon after, I asked my mom to just forget it. Maybe this would all go away but it didn't. The next day, I told him that I wasn't allowed to talk to him anymore because my mom told me not to, but he still refused to leave me alone. I obviously got mad due to having enough of his crap and had a complete mental breakdown, saying that I was going to get Tim, my boyfriend, on him because I was done. Grace and Felicity, my other friend, tried to take me to one of their most trusted teachers, but a few other teachers, despite seeing me crying hysterically, refused to let us through. Because they said that she probably wouldn't be able to help us. So, we found another teacher and explained the whole situation to her. She assured me that she would speak with him and attempt to get this sorted out throughout the entirety of my geography class. I was having major anxiety. But I calmed down a bit in math. And when lunch came about, I saw Grace standing next to the door, holding someone else's stuff. What the hell is this about, I questioned. I don't know. He just dumped it on me and left. Now he's in the toilet, she told me. Then one of my male friends who knew about the situation, Chad, approached us and offered to take his stuff while we left. I thanked him a million times and we hurried away. We reached the hall and sat down at the table where Sally and Felicity were, and everything seemed fine until he showed up again. He seemed pretty angry, so I assumed the teacher we'd spoken to had talked to him. I began to panic, thinking that this wouldn't end well, that we were in danger. Then Rafita, another close friend, walked over to him, attempting to save me from an episode. She told him that I didn't feel good and that he should probably go. 
but he completely ignored her and asked me if I wanted some food. I nervously shook my head and he started saying that he was going to pass out and that he needed to sit down. Rafida calmly told him that he could go sit somewhere else because this isn't the best time. He turned to her fury in his eyes and yelled. Now I hid my face in my hands and felt weak. Like I was going to start hyperventilating. He sat down and Rafida, having had enough of this too, grabbed my arm and said, Come on, let's go. While dragging me away. And the others followed. He also left the hall, but luckily he didn't follow us. Then all of a sudden, the built-up stress and anger caused me to start hyperventilating and crying because I felt like I put not only myself, but the others in danger. I didn't know what to do anymore, then Chad came and said that he'd talk to him for me and asked him to sit with him instead of us once again. I thanked him with all my heart and we went back to the hall. One of my old friends, Shayla, is now transgender and his name is Jaden, came up to us and we told her about the entire situation. She told us that this wasn't the first time something like this had happened, and that he had a book in which he wrote about plans for mass homicide, and that he called it Samuelism. Then Chad returned and told me that Samuel wants to talk to me after science, and how I probably should, so after science I waited for him. And he said he hadn't realized he was causing a problem. Shut up of course, you did. How can you be so dumb oblivious to your own actions? He then proceeded to tell me how bad his day was and I ended up having to walk him to the office. I told Tim about it and he said he would meet me after school on Wednesdays and sort it out if he didn't stop. I was very thankful for this. I just wanted Samuel out of my life but he still wouldn't leave me alone. After all, that he was specifically moved next to me in English class after everything that happened on Friday. He still persisted with his little games that day. Was parents evening at school. So I went with my mom and left my phone at home. When I got back and looked at my phone, my heart dropped. 20 messages, 20 of them within half an hour, all from Samuel. I started ranting about all of this to myself and even went to the bathroom to practice what I was going to say to him the next day. I started crying again because all of this was just too much to bear. But then I decided to do something. I decided to call him out on all of his stuff and inform them that a troubled childhood is an excuse to put someone in this situation. He actually tried to guilt trip me into forgiving him by telling me his awful childhood. And I admit that I felt bad for him because no one should have to go through that kind of pain. But to show him that he isn't the only one who has to deal with things in the past, I told him about myself halfway through me explaining that I had a lot of trouble showing and experiencing emotions as a child, and that I had a lot of violent homicidal thoughts. He interrupted me, saying that he also didn't have emotions and that he had tried to kill someone because he thought it was funny. This actually pissed me off because not only was he interrupting me to add to his story and trying to make me feel even worse, he was trying to one-up me on my suffering. If you ask me, that is absolutely disgusting. You don't compare struggles because you only have your own experiences to go off. Don't try to make another person feel as though their problems don't matter, and that they shouldn't ask for help when their problems because they're too small. That's just wrong. I calmly told him that I let him finish his story without interruptions and that it was only fair for him to let me finish mine. That way, too, he quickly apologized, being caught out on his crap. I told him the rest of my story and let him realize that he really wasn't the only one who had gone through stuff in his childhood. He then began begging me for another chance at being my friend, but I declined and decided to talk with Sally instead, ignoring the rest of his messages every day. Until that point, and even for a while after, just me feeling like I was going to die, I actually contemplated suicide for a while because I couldn't deal with his constant presence. 
I was afraid to leave my house because I felt like he would be there. I know this is a bit weird, but I felt that way because of the schizophrenia my episodes began getting more frequent and severe. There were periods of time where I could not concentrate in class and actually could hear what the teacher was saying because of my auditory hallucinations. I generally felt like crap and it got so bad that I felt like I didn't want to be here anymore. But after telling him to bugger off, I felt like a giant weight has been removed from my chest and that I could breathe my own air again. Not for long though, because he kept trying to come back into my life despite me refusing to be his friend ever again. I was still there for him, but only in absolute emergencies, and by that, I mean that only if he was on the verge of dying. I wish I could say that he left me alone since then and that I never saw him again after that, but I couldn't. Because I still see him around at school, and unfortunately, he's friends with my friend Brian. So I still have to hang out around him, which sucks. He annoys me purposely to get my attention by calling himself God and other things that suggest he thinks way too highly of himself. Anyway, that's about it for my story. Samuel, please shut up about your godly status for a second and realize that the reason people hate you is because you do this not once, not twice, but always. So pause, think, and stop so that you don't mount any more brains. So for the longest time in my teenage years, I earned a few bucks a week by doing babysitting work. It always made me giggle at how there are so many urban legends based around babysitting. The serial killer that stalks the unwitting teen, the call coming from inside the house. Pretty much every Halloween movie in some manner that seems to present babysitting as the vocation of those with a death wish. When in reality, the only thing likely to kill you is the boredom. Sure, you get a bratty kid and makes an evening a little more challenging, but you get a good one. And you're basically sat on the couch for hours on end watching tedious cable TV shows and counting the minutes until the parents get home. Saying that I did babysitting for one family that ended in a frankly terrifying experience that ended up in me never, ever sitting for them ever again. It only happened once, but sometimes, once is enough. So I arrived at this big old house a few blocks away from my parents' house at around 6.31 Friday evening. The parents of the kid seemed incredibly charming, and the kid is one of the more adorable little tykes that I've had the good fortune of minding. We go over a brief list of rules, what the kid is and isn't allowed to eat, how much I'll be paid, and how long I'll be sitting for, and that sort of thing. Then the parents head out to whatever fancy party that they had been planning on attending. All goes well for a little while. The kid wouldn't eat their carrots, but when I pretended that they were delicious by taking little bites myself, they soon broke into a smile and pretty much demolished the little bowl of hummus that we were sharing. With a kid fed, I gave her a bath, tucked her in the bed, and that's that. It was honestly one of the easiest jobs I'd had, right up until the sun started to go down. So once the kid's asleep, I head downstairs to order a pizza on the parents' dollar. Like I said, they were perfectly nice and polite when we first met, and it's not often that job comes with free food. Pizza arrives pretty quickly, and I even tipped the delivery guy a few dollars just to say thank you for being so fast. He's literally counting out the change in dollar bills when his head snaps to the side, like he's looking into the bushes at the side of the house. I asked him if everything's okay, peering out from the door to see what he's looking at. But there's nothing. Just dark bushes. He said something along the lines of, say, guess I'm just tired. Mine's playing tricks on me. He laughs awkwardly, then walks back to his car while thanking me again for the tip. I didn't think anything of it. I mean, 
was probably just a cat or something, right? So again, back inside they eat, have a full-on carb overload, and ended up just lying there on the couch watching TLC. There were these big bay windows in the family's TV room, and I had drawn the curtains earlier to block out the glare on the TV only, and drawn them all the way, and there was a slight crack in the curtains that allowed me to see into the dark front yard. At one point, my eyes were drawn to this little crack, and I could swear I saw a dark shape where street lights were previously visible. I sit up, focusing my eyes on the shape and wondering if it were my mind playing tricks on me this time. When it moved, wasn't going nuts. I had been looking at someone or something who was in turn looking at me through the big old windows. That's about when I started to freak out. I had been super chilled all evening, but now I was getting that distinctly paranoid feeling like someone was watching me. Someone who didn't exactly have the best of intentions. I ran around the house, making sure all the doors and windows are locked as a precaution, all before keeping their cordless phone as close as possible so that if it came to it, I could call the cops. I was sure I had seen someone, but the chances of them just vacating the area at the sight of flashing lights then returning later could be a huge possibility, and a terrifying one at that. So I decided to shoot my shot only when it would be absolutely necessary. Appearing to waste police time would not be doing me any favors. I suppose I'm just trying to explain why I didn't call the cops right away. I've had friends of mine that said that. They have just called 911 right then and there, but I wasn't 100% sure of anything right then. I'd seen a shape. Michael Myers pointing a knife at me. Life isn't black and white most of the time, I was thinking anyway. I've secured all the windows and doors, shoved the cordless phone into my hoodie's front pouch, and have even positioned the Little League bat near the couch, so that I was sort of armed. So by that point, I started to feel relatively safe again. If there was some creeper lurking outside looking to prey on a teenage babysitter, they would get one heck of a rude awakening when I waved my bat at them and screamed that the cops are on the way. So I lined back on the couch, but naturally find myself unable to relax. I open the curtains back up so I can see if anyone is hanging around in the front yard, keeping my eyes on the windows every so often in between watching whatever social train wreck is on TLC. Nothing happens for a while, and I start to think it was all just in my head or something. Right about the time I get up to wander in the kitchen to grab a drink of water, as I'm in there, I get that intense feeling that I'm being watched. I turn to see that same dark shape in the kitchen window. Only this time, I rush into action. A hammer 911 in the phone, telling the dispatcher I need the cops to my address, ASAP, that there's a home invasion in progress. I honestly don't know if it was the adrenaline or I was just sick of pervs thinking they can get away with stuff like that, but I just sort of charged after, screaming out that the cops were on their way. I ran into the TV room, grabbing the Little League bat, and just ran for the back door which led out of the kitchen and into the backyard. What happened next is frankly astounding. As I ran it, the guy, baseball bat in hand, ready to bash his brains out right there in the yard. I recognized him instantly. It was a face I'd seen before, not long ago at all. It was the kid's dad. So long story short, the dad of the kid I had been babysitting had for whatever reason decided that you need to see what kind of babysitter I was to apparently he drove his wife to whatever party they were headed to, turned back saying he'd forgotten something, then decided to watch me over the course of about an hour or two to see if I was worth the cash that they were spending. Obviously, since no crime was actually committed, 
there was no one to charge. The dad offered me a sincere apology. He even offered me double the cash just to finish the night out, but I refused. No amount of money could have persuaded me to stay, and needless to say, I was very selective with who I babysat after that. When the event I'm about to share happened, I was 20 years old, and I'm sharing it because I know I'm not the only guy who has gone through it. I also know that as a guy, these types of experiences can leave one feeling confused, embarrassed, or worse. Now, my mother used to be a manager at a hen house grocery store in the city where I was born and raised. When a job opening became available in the deli, she offered the position to me, so I took it. And I was working with three other people, one of which I became fast friends with. His name was Alvin, and he had moved to the Midwest from Louisiana. I forgot exactly what he said had happened, but the gist of it was that he had gotten into some trouble back home and his mom asked Alvin's brother if he could come and stay with him. When I met Alvin's older brother, I was excited to find out that he worked as a sheriff's deputy in the county I lived in. I had planned to become a police officer myself once I turned 21, so having Alvin's older brother as a sort of mentor made it seem all the more possible. One night, I heard the honk of a car horn in front of my home. Peeking out the window, I recognized the car to be Alvin's brother's unmarked sheriff's vehicle. It was only one minute from the grocery store and five minutes from his house, so it didn't seem all that out of place. But I was a bit confused as to why he stopped by so late. To be honest, I was kind of hoping he would invite me for a ride along which is where a civilian rides shotgun with an on-duty police officer to learn more about what law enforcement does. When I got to the car, he told me to hop in, so I was up. I asked Alvin went to some rave out in the country somewhere, and I'm worried about him, so I want to go get him, he answered. I just wanted to swing by and ask if he wanted to ride along and help me search for the location. Yeah, sure. I said it was so long. I can't really remember how long we drove around, but where my mother and I lived was already on the edge of the city, so getting to the rural parts wouldn't have taken that long. However, he did drive away out and the darkness swallowed everything that was illuminated by the car's headlights. I had attended many raves in my teens, so I do remember finding it odd that a rave would be held in the rural area we were in. Then at some point, Alvin's brother said, you know I love you, right? Now, I was far from an innocent kid growing up, so I was immediately suspicious of this off-the-wall question, whatever it was. Yeah, bro, you're a good friend, I answered, emphasizing the words bro and friend. Nah, you don't get it, he replied, in a way that sounded frustrated. I'm in love with you. He continued emphasizing the words in, in love. This isn't good. A voice screamed in my head. I sort of glanced at his service weapon on his head pod to the corner of my eye and thought, this is really bad. Then I noticed the car began to slow down, and I looked over at Alvin's brother who was staring at me, the car now moving at a crawl. Look, he began, I'll take care of you. I got a lot of money, so I can buy you a car or house, whatever you want. Just let me have you. This time, the voice in my head wouldn't stop screaming. My heart was pounding, and sweat began to slowly drip down my face. I'm, I'm not like that, bro, I tried to explain. You know, I have a permanent girlfriend. I'm not like that. Now the car wasn't moving, and though it was inky dark around us, Light from the car's instrument panel only glowed a little, and I was able to see the scowl on his face. Well, it seems the rave may have already shut down, he said after what seemed like an hour of sitting in the middle of a dark rural road in awkward silence. He then pulled a U-turn and began heading back in the direction we had just come. And thank God! I finally arrived home after maybe a 45-minute drive of silence and awkwardness. As we pulled up in front of my house, I went to open the door and get out, but felt his hand grab my forearm. If you tell anyone about this, 
Just remember. He trailed off as if thinking twice about what he was about to say. And then he let my arm go, and I got out of his car. I shut the door and never turned to look back. I just wanted to get inside my house as fast as I could and lock the door. I never saw or heard from Alvin's brother again after that, and I'm glad. My older brother was one of those people who liked to scare me and my other siblings as much as possible. I couldn't really blame him for it because, although I didn't like being scared myself, I was just as guilty as trying to scare our younger brothers and sisters as well. But kids are allowed to be a little hypocritical, aren't we? The thing that always scared me the most was this big old house that my brother and I walked by every day on the way to and from school. The town we lived in didn't have bus service for any of the kids who lived in the town itself, so we had to walk to school. It was a good half an hour walk. The house that my brother always talked about was a really old Victorian that of course looked like it hadn't been kept up in decades. The lawn was completely dead and there was not anything but brown grass. An old dead tree was in the backyard with a decayed tire swing swaying from it. Old broken bicycles, tricycles, and other contraptions littered the backyard as well. There was an old rusty shed there too. There was never a car in the driveway, and we never saw anyone leaving or entering the place. But we knew that someone lived there because if you walked by in the evening, you could see blue lights shining from behind the curtains as if somebody was inside watching TV in the dark. Whenever the two of us walked by the house, my brother would always make strange comments about what was going on in there. I had to pretend like it didn't scare me, but I was only 12 years old at the time, and I was quite easily scared. He would tell me the man was a butcher who preyed on the little kids in the neighborhood who were stupid enough to walk up to his front door. My brother said the old man would grab the kid, take them out to his shed, hang them from their feet, and then lightly slice their skin open with a fine knife, and then slowly let them die as the blood trickled out into a tub that was under them. Growing up, every time he was in the mood to do it, my brother would dare me to go to the guy's door and break one of the old pots on it. I always declined because I told him I didn't want to get in trouble. He would then make fun of me for being a scaredy cat and taunt me for hours. On Halloween the year that I turned 12, rather than going trick-or-treating, I was invited to hang out with my brother and his friends. They were doing what we at the time considered mature things. We egged some houses. We lit a flaming bag or two. It was a fun night. Late in the night, my brother and his friends decided to haze the new guy, being me. They dared me to go up to the old Victorian house and break one of the pots on the porch. As much as I wanted to be accepted by my brother and his friends, I did not want to do that. And they taunted me for it. And it was humiliating. But my fear was much stronger than the humiliation, and I continued to refuse to do it. When the taunting got really bad, I angrily blurted out to my brother, Well, if you're so brave, why don't you go do it? My brother hadn't expected that, and it worked perfectly because one of his buddies immediately turned to him and asked him that as well. Suddenly, all the attention was off of me, and it was turned to my brother. 
he was really taken off guard by the development. Still, my brother had to prove that he had the guts to do it. It was one thing for his little brother to be taunted, but he knew he could never live it down. So, acting all brave, although I could tell he was really scared, my brother walked up to the porch of the old building. You could tell he was scared out of his mind, but he didn't let it show. When he got up the steps, he grabbed an old flower pot and pulled it over his head. As he held the pot above him, proud of himself for what he was doing, I saw the door open behind him. A huge man walked up behind him as he was about to throw the pot. His buddy started screaming at my brother, telling him there was someone behind him. He just looked at us all like he didn't believe us. He just thought that they were trying to scare him. As he dropped the pot on the ground and it shattered though, the guy grabbed my brother around the neck and held him there. My brother's chicken friends all ran off immediately. I couldn't do that though. My brother had just been grabbed by a lunatic. I ran up to them before the guy could pull my brother into the house and tried to pull my brother away. The man swatted at me several times. He was huge and he was choking the life out of my brother. Not knowing what else to do, I realized I had to take the cheapest shot possible. It was the only way I could help my brother. I kicked the guy square in the crotch. He groaned in shock, but he didn't let go of my brother. So I kicked him again. And again. I kicked this huge man a total of six times before he finally let go of my brother. Although my brother was wheezing and struggling to breathe, I knew we had to get away from the recently sterilized psychopath and I pulled him away. It was difficult, but we were able to get out of his yard and down the street before he was able to do anything. Our parents called the police, but get this, they wouldn't do anything about it. My brother was not only trespassing, but he vandalized the guy's porch. We were all shocked and my parents were outraged, but the police did absolutely nothing. This man got away with it. Now, I'm the first one to admit what my brother did was wrong, but the guy was strangling him. Afterwards, my parents drove my brother and I to and from school every day. They figured it was best to avoid the guy as much as possible. The one good thing that came out of this was my brother had a lot more respect for me. It was at least two months before he began ragging on me again. But that's how brothers are. We have always been a big fan of pizza here in New York, but we did not like that factory-made bullshit. We liked the fresh-baked Italian pizzas, made in the oven from back in Italy. And every time someone said pizza, we would take them through the trails of all the authentic Italian pizza places we had in the city. There was even an official pizza tour guide that would help you get the best pizza in town and especially when it was about our little block that was authentic Italian neighborhood, and the culture was really strong in that part, and the food was an important part of the culture. So everyone knew everybody, and every business there was owned by someone you know. It was a tight-knitted community, and we enjoyed all our adventures, gatherings, and the food that was made at these gatherings, and we were not like one of those exclusive communities. We welcomed everybody and we loved to feed people. And the authentic Italian meal was something everybody would look out for. And it was quite satisfying to watch our neighborhood thrive so much and be better. Us Italians, we believed in two things to be the most important. Number one, family. Family is the most important. 
And number two thing was food. The two most single most important things, the family and the food. We took great pride in both of them, and the rules were pretty simple. Never cross the family, and never cross the food. And while someone who did them both, we made sure got the worst of the Italy. Roman was one of the nephew of Modigliani. He was the builder who was responsible for building the new fancy stores in the neighborhood. And because of them, the neighborhood was getting the outside attention. An attention we didn't really like or cared about. We were an exclusive neighborhood for a reason. We made sure that the culture that we had inherited from our fathers and forefathers must live on. Roman was one of the new kids, and as the new kid, he never understood what it meant to be in that neighborhood, and what the sense of community was about. These kids were born into the world of social media and mobile phones. They don't know what it is to connect in person, to feel the way the whole community feels, and their individuality sometimes disguises itself as progress, and people just go with it. We saw the community thrive and build, and these building parks and small establishments were all part of it. They had their stories, and now Roman was the one to sign out the documents to sell Papa Marici, one of the oldest pizza places to some Atwood guy. It was the end of an era for us. We never thought that we would ever witness such things, but here we are. But we were much cool about it than some of the people in the community, like Rob. Rob went on to Roman's place and threatened him about him selling the place to some hack. Now, Rob and his group was one that were most unhappy about the changes, since Papa Marachi was the place that they hung out, and when they decided to turn that place into scrap, they were pissed and wanted to really beat Roman. But even after all that, Roman was still family, so all they could do is bicker with him and nothing more than that. Roman assured everyone that it will be all right as the Atwood guy is going to open a new and better pizza place. They were a bit relieved that the place isn't going anywhere, and I guess it was about the dynamics of the place that people did not want to miss, so they waited to see what the Atwood guy would bring. Though skeptic, they were waiting patiently to see what it becomes. And as long as the place wasn't transitioned into something that they hated, they were good with Roman. A few weeks later, the news broke, and the things were placed in order, and everybody flipped when they realized that it was a Domino's that was going to open up in the neighborhood. The whole neighborhood was flipping over the fact that the Atwood guy had the audacity to open something like Domino's in a place where there were several authentic pizzerias that had been functioning for decades, and some even lasting for around a hundred years. And this just made Rob and the guys lose their minds. Wasn't tearing down the neighborhood enough that they had to open up Domino's in the authentic Italian neighborhood? Rob did not take this nicely and went to plaster Atwood when Roman stopped him. They were about to beat Roman when Roman said he had no idea that the guy would be opening up a Domino's in the neighborhood. And I remember they had an argument about pizza for about an hour until they decided that they will together make sure that Atwood gets pulp beaten out of him. And they went and brought the guy out. They were having a heated argument about the place. Atwood was firm about his decision. He wanted Domino's in there. The argument soon turned ugly, and they started fighting. And then, in the heat of the moment, the Atwood guy took out a gun and shot Roman three times. And before he could shoot Rob, Rob disarmed the Atwood guy. Roman was taken but to the hospital by Miss Rabisi and his folks in the car and Atwood was now surrounded by the neighborhood. And I remember the neighborhood was angry and fierce, and they started beating everyone who was related to Atwood in the place. They were lynching him and kicking him while he was down, and his guys were getting beaten at pulp. It was quite possible that they would die with that kind of beating, but I secretly called the police. I did not want the neighborhood to be in peril. And then when the police came, they broke them out. Thankfully, no one got killed, neither Atwood nor his guys, and Roman survived the shots too. There was nothing good that was going to come out of it, but one good thing did come out. It was the dominoes. It wasn't going to open, and the place became a chill community kitchen, 
and now it serves hot Italian food to people who can't afford it. The first and the last time that I ever went to the Starbucks was with my friend Nate. He told me that the coffee there is great and that I can befriend some girls in there. Though the thing with Nate was that it was all about the girls for him, and I didn't care much about that. At least, not until I actually left for college. My school were just over, and Nate was already starting the first year of college. He was a year older than me, and he was already settling into the college, and I was about to join him in the same college a year later. And Nate always told me, with girls, you want to be experienced as you can, because college is rough as an inexperienced person. And when I often asked him, isn't college for studies? And he would just say, yes, if you want to be a doctor or something, but even nerds need to have a good time in there. And even though every time he opened his mouth, he sounded like an idiot, inside he was actually a very caring and generous man, and a great friend on top of that to top it all off. He was an A student and have gotten into all Ivy League colleges but ignore them. He was a legend to us, and that is why I looked up to him. He was a great mentor regardless of that shallow image that he tried to show off in. Our friendship was much more than I had with everyone who was in my class, so I hang out with Nate often. Nate was the kind of person you would think would be very communist on the edge, kind of the guy, but with all the things considered, he was very much into Starbucks, and it was the same Starbucks that he would go to every time. It was weird at first when I thought about it, and then I realized that it wasn't actually the coffee that he was interested in. As a matter of fact, it was the girl who made it. Nate was in love with this girl who worked at the Starbucks, and he often visited the place because of the girl. At first you wouldn't know that he was infatuated by her, but the frequent visits and the occasional blushing when she was around made it certain that Nate wasn't at the place for the sake of coffee. It was the first time that I saw Nate acting weird and underconfident. You wouldn't cross him as someone who would be this blushing and so quiet. It was out of ordinary for him to act in such a way. But it was Nate. He was obsessive in everything he did. And this felt like one of those occasions. Every single time we went to the Starbucks, he would line up and switch lines when she wasn't the one serving the coffee. Then one day when we were sitting, I said to Nate, Come on, man. You have to ask her out. You're freaking Nate. You're the boss, man. And Nate looked at me as he wanted to get back the confidence that he was losing and decided that he will ask the girl out. And he did. Her name was Natalie. And they were Nate and Natalie and looked so good together. But they were meant to be together. They were pretty much in love. And now that Nate had Natalie, he would spend much less time. Nate even thanked me when they got together as if I did everything. Nate and Natalie were going perfectly, and now we would hang out more in the Starbucks and get more and more free coffees. They were all good and tight, when one day, something happened that forever changed everything. It was the usual Friday night, and we were all at the Starbucks. Nate was sitting around, and Natalie was waiting for the shift to get over, and then from the front gate, the guy came in. His name was Michael. Michael was one of those quiet kids that always had a thing for Natalie. He came inside and straight away came over to our table and said to Nate, You're not good enough for Natalie. You'll never be. And you try, I will make sure you die. And then Nate said, Alright man, and then shrugged him off. But that must have pissed off Michael, because the next thing he did was took the gun out and then shot Nate in his chest. There was nothing but silence. Nate's blood spattered across my face, and I was in shock of everything. And Nate was lying lifeless, and I was in complete trauma of losing my friend. And then that was the day that I last entered the Starbucks. There are still flashbacks of the incident that keep me awake in the night. This happened a few years ago, and sometimes I still have nightmares about not getting away. Let me start off by saying that I live in a pretty big city. Lots of bars and clubs, and I have experience with partying and drugs. I have been in blackout drunk situations, and this was not that. But I no longer go out on my own. That night, I decided to go out with some friends bar hopping. I mainly knew only one of the girls that I hung out with regularly. 
and the other two were more acquaintances. I was very outgoing and loved meeting people, so that was nothing new for me. We had a few drinks at a bar and continued on to the next one. We were having fun and a great time when one of the girls I didn't know well pulled out the party stuff sometime during our second bar visit. I decided to skip it because I wasn't looking to get messed up that night. But my friend said yes, and she and the third girl went to the bathroom. The second girl, let's call her Bob, kept insisting I go with the two others. I kept declining, but she got a little aggressive. After the third time, I'd said no. My friend came back from the bathroom, and Bob acted like nothing had just happened. Then we met some guys who joined our group to have a flirt. And I was in a relationship. But my friend and Bob weren't. By the time the second girl had left and Bob and my friend was starting to get pretty messed up, I went to use the bathroom and texted my boyfriend that I was coming home soon, but saw that my phone was dead. When I came back to the table, the guys had given his shots. I was still pretty sober and declined the shot, but Bob shoved the shot into my hand, so to avoid a scene, I took it. I then went to tell my friend that I was heading home, but I took one look at hers and Bob's faces and I could see they were out of it. I was starting to feel pretty woozy myself at that point, so I grabbed all our stuff and started shoving them to go. The guys that bought the shots were protesting, but I wasn't getting any resistance from the girls. I hailed a cab, my phone was dead. So, no Uber and I remembered putting the girls in the back and telling the driver that we were dropping them off first, then going to my address. During the journey, I blacked out, but I remember dropping off my friend. Then I blacked out again and was alone with the driver. I was in the front seat and he was holding my hand. I looked around disoriented. I took in the sight of him holding my hand while striving, like he was my boyfriend or something. I saw my wallet in the center cup holder and the meter was off. He was telling me that he was taking me to a romantic place, but I told him no, and to please take me home as my boyfriend was waiting for me. He then said something along the lines of stop talking about him. I told you which in hindsight indicates that I had told him already many times about him. He said he just wanted to pretend for a little and held my hand tighter. I didn't want to trigger a violent reaction so I let my hand where it was and started to reach for my wallet with my other. He saw me let go of my hand and took my wallet from the cup holder to his other side where I couldn't reach it. I was still woozy and blacked out again. And when I came to my senses, we were parked near a very well-known romantic and touristy location in my city. Normally, this place was packed, but not that night is pretty far from anything else and surrounded by woods. I started to cry and begged him to please take me home because I wanted to see my boyfriend and that I would tell anyone what he was doing. He looked at me and said, I will take you home if you pretend you are my girlfriend for a little while. I sat there in shock, wishing my brain wasn't much. I wished in fact that I had never gone out in the first place. I wished I could see my boyfriend for the thousandth time that night. I said okay and he smiled, put my wallet back in the cup holder, and I took it slowly, putting it under my leg. He took my hand and looked out the front window and out into the little lake that he had brought me to. He then started talking, but I don't remember what he was saying. I was just trying not to black out again. I waited for him to look at me and asked again for him to please take me home. He said only if I let him give me a kiss. I said no. He looked mad for a fraction of a second, and then squeezed the hand was still holding. He then leaned in fast and kissed me anyway, but I kept my lips sealed tight against him ready to fight, ready to bite and scratch and not go down easily. He let go of my hand and backed away, then started the car and we finally began our way back to civilization. I was crying as silently as possible, trying not to be heard so he would forget I was there and not touch me. I waited until we were near enough people that I could bolt out of the car and find another way home, 
but I think he saw me grabbing my wallet from under my leg and knew my intention to jump out of the next light. He snatched it again and said he would drive me. So I nodded as by then I didn't care about the wallet, my phone, or anything else. I just needed to jump out no matter what. As I was going to get home. I had no clue what time it was by then either. But I do know there was almost no cars out of my usual busy city. No buses and no people. But I didn't care anymore. He eventually stopped at a red light. And I unlocked the door, yanked it open, ran, and didn't look back but I heard a car peel out of the intersection. And he was running to my phone, still dead. No wallet, so no money. And really far from the house. I was still drowsy and crying, and I had no idea of the time. I started walking then, when I heard a car pull up near me. I started running instinctively when I heard a woman's voice yell out, Are you okay? I stopped and turned around to the most beautiful person I have ever seen in the entire world, walking towards me slowly with her hands out in front as not to scare me. I started crying harder, being the most incoherent that I've ever been. She hugged me so hard and asked for my boyfriend's number so she could call him. He answered straight away and she told him where I was and that I was okay. And she was bringing me home. I cried the whole way back, trying to explain what had happened, but still woozy, still freaking out. It was hard. So we drove in relative silence. When we got home, my boyfriend was waiting outside, losing his mind. My savior gave me a phone number to call her when I felt better and drove off. It was 5 a.m., and I'd left the bar at 10. That's all I can remember a week later and my wallet showed up in my mailbox. For the past few years or so, I've lived here in Redwood City, California. Back in 2008, some of you might remember that a Philadelphia branch of Starbucks asked two African Americans to leave because they hadn't bought anything. They were accused of racism, there was a whole bunch of fallout from it, and in the end, Starbucks announced that it would no longer ask anyone to leave their stores as long as they weren't causing a disturbance. From what I heard, this prompted a bunch of trouble with homeless people hanging around Starbucks outlets and generally making a nuisance of themselves, but I can't really speak to that because the only homeless guy that ever showed up in my local Starbucks was Steve. Steve was about as far from the stereotypical idea of a homeless person as you can imagine. I remember seeing him in relatively clean clothes, tapping away on a smartphone that was charging from a nearby power outlet and not giving him a second glance. I walked in, got my coffee, and carried on my way to work. The next morning, Steve is there again, paper in front of him, tapping away on his smartphone. Only this time, as I'm in line waiting to give my order, I see him reaching for a grubby looking backpack that seemed to contain all of his worldly possessions. It dawned on me that he didn't have a coffee in front of him and when I thought about it, he didn't have one that day before either. And that's when I realized that Steve was in fact homeless. And it was then that I actually noticed how tired he looked, how the skin of his face was stretched around his eye sockets like he'd skipped one too many meals in his time. Steve was obviously taking advantage of Starbucks' new policy in order to get indoors and charge his phone, and although he was technically taking up the space of a paying customer, none who got an inkling of his living situation ever seemed to complain. This was until one day when Steve got himself into some kind of confrontation with a customer. I think maybe one of his bag straps was lying in the way of someone because I only looked up in time after hearing someone apologize. This big guy in a bad suit scoffed as he sat down close by, shaking his head. Shouldn't even be here, the big guy said. I thought it was quite an obnoxious comment, but I'm far too much of an introvert to say anything about it. Steve tried to apologize again, but the guy started going off on him, telling him he shouldn't be there if he wasn't a paying customer. And in a display of kindness that'll stay with me for the rest of my life, the guy at the head of the line bought Steve a coffee and a red berry cheese danish. There, now he has something, so mind your business. It wasn't one of those and then everyone clapped moments, it was still incredibly awkward since no one wanted to get into a shouting match at that time in the morning, 
especially not me. So after the fat guy was shamed into silence, he just sort of wrapped his double-smoked bacon and walked out, avoiding eye contact as he went. That's when I found out his name was Steve, and every morning after, if Steve was in the Starbucks, I'd always say hi and asked if he wanted a coffee or a red berry cheese. Some mornings he'd accept, some he'd decline, and I came to learn that he used the charger and the free Wi-Fi to look for a job. He wasn't a drug addict, he wasn't an alcoholic, he'd just fallen on hard times after a nervous breakdown and was slowly building himself back up and putting his life back together. Learning that is how me and a handful of other Starbucks regulars developed a great deal of affection for Steve after a while, but our regular cheery encounters with him somehow made it easier to forget that he slept under Redwood Junction every night, and I guess assuring ourselves that Steve would be okay meant we could just walk away and not worry about it. Because one Monday morning when I walked into the Starbucks and saw Steve's seat empty, I automatically assumed it was good news. Maybe he'd found a place to stay, or maybe he'd struck gold in his job search, and I found myself asking the barista if they'd heard anything from Steve over the weekend. To my absolute delight, he told me Steve had an interview at a local car wash. He wasn't sure exactly what day, he just knew that Steve had made the announcement the previous afternoon before departing the store. So, that was the end of seeing Steve on my morning Starbucks runs. I hoped that he might show up again, buying his own coffee, looking healthier and happier, but he didn't, and I guess that was just fine. But at the same time, I'd have been lying if I said I didn't kind of miss him. Like I might have mentioned, I'm a card-carrying introvert, but I do enjoy a sense of community. I still enjoy the comfort of familiar faces, so anyone who makes me comfortable enough to come out of my shell, I appreciate that more than I think I can even describe. So after a few weeks of not seeing Steve at all, I decided to take a walk down to some of the local car washes to see if I could spot Steve. First place I asked hadn't heard of him, neither had the second place. But the third car wash I tried said that they were hoping I was the one who could give them answers. You see, the third place I tried was indeed the same place Steve had an interview scheduled, but it was an interview he hadn't shown up for. I asked if he'd called ahead to cancel or anything, and the car wash boss said no, and that he just ghosted. And that's when I really started to worry. My concern for Steve's well-being grew to the point where I began to entertain the idea of going down to the Redwood Junction to look for him. I hope I don't sound too prejudiced when I say I found it an intimidating prospect. Like as much as I appreciate that a lot of homeless people are just like Steve, good people who've fallen on hard times, I know that there are some people in the streets who are so broken that they do actually pose a danger to the general public. But as I said, my concern grew and grew until I didn't give a good care if the sight of homeless people camp would upset my delicate sensibilities. A man's life was at stake. I needed to act. I wasn't sure I'd be able to live with myself otherwise. That was how I ended up cycling down to the junction one Saturday afternoon where I began nervously giving descriptions of Steve and asking if people had seen him. People mostly shook their heads at me, looking at me like I'd grown an extra nose or something. I guess having visitors to the camp wasn't exactly a common occurrence. Time and time again I was met with the same response. A shrug, a shake of the head, complete indifference. At least until I spoke to one much older guy who wore a Vietnam veteran baseball cap and a grimy old fatigue jacket. This guy seemed a little bit more with it than some of the other homeless folks and although he had the distinct smell of marijuana about him, he was lucid enough to get a straight answer from. After confirming we were talking about the same Steve, this vet told me that he knew him well, but that he hadn't been around the junction in a few days. When I pressed him for where Steve might have gone, the vet shrugged, but told me Steve had left behind a bunch of his belongings. According to him, this could be a good thing just as much as a bad thing. When some homeless folks find a way off the street, either moving back in with family or getting a place in a program somewhere, they leave behind all their stuff. Some just don't need it anymore. A tent and a sleeping bag are useless when you have a room and a bed but others find that the stuff they had on the street just reminds them of a time they'd rather just forget about. But sometimes, 
Sometimes, leaving all their stuff behind meant something bad had happened. I could see the worry just etched into the vet's face, and he seemed to be racking his brain for a moment before an idea struck him. He mentioned that Steve used to bring food to a girl who stayed on the other side of the camp, and that maybe she'd know where he was. Up until talking to that girl, my time at the camp had been unexpectedly uplifting. Sure, seeing people living like that was upsetting, but seeing how nice some of them were, how they hadn't let their hardships break them down, seeing them purely as the human beings they are, I have to say, it was quite cathartic. Yet the visit to the girl's tent was the point at which the trip became more terrifying than I ever imagined it could be. As we approached the girl's tent, the vet greeted someone nearby and asked if a person called Mouse was home. They nodded, but added that she wasn't doing too good. I wasn't sure what they meant by that, but on seeing this mouse girl curled up in a fetal position in her tent, I was almost certain it was drug-related. The vet gently shook the girl awake, and I'm pretty sure she was high from the way she lazily opened her eyes and how out of it she seemed. But then as soon as the guy mentioned Steve's name, the girl shoots wide open and she gives him this terrified look before saying, I, I told him not to go. I told him not to, but he didn't listen. Now he's gone. The vet asks her where. Where did she tell Steve not to go? She replies with, the cemetery, before bursting into tears. The last question we could get her to answer was what happened at the cemetery for Steve to be gone. She replied with, it took him. It. Not he or they. It. Hearing that word used like that caused this sinking feeling in my stomach. Not so much because of what it entailed, but because this girl was so messed up over what happened and that obviously meant bad news for Steve. Before leaving the camp, I asked the vet what cemetery Mouse could have been talking about. I had my own idea of which one she was referring to, I just wanted to see if he had the same answer, and he did. He'd said he'd bet his last dime that she was talking about the historic Union Cemetery on Woodside Road. And I agreed, because the historic Union Cemetery is right across the street from the hand car wash where Steve was scheduled to have his interview. I took all this information to the police, telling them I was a friend of Steve's before I had them file a missing persons report. I made sure to record the reference number I was giving as I'd be able to use it to get in touch with whatever detectives would eventually be assigned to the case, I assumed. I tried all throughout that next week to get the relevant cops on the phone, but it seemed to take forever before the case was properly assigned. In the meantime, I thought I'd take a ride down to the cemetery to see if anything caught my eye. I don't really know what I was planning on doing. It's not like I knew anything about being a detective, but at the same time, I couldn't just sit on my butt and do nothing. So, for those of you that don't know, Redwood City's historic Union Cemetery isn't really a cemetery. It did actually function as one until about 1919 or so, but after that it basically became a kind of memorial. From what I can remember... Some Civil War soldiers are buried there along with a few famous pioneers, so it's more for tourists and sightseers than grieving families or funeral processions. While walking up and down the gravel paths and checking out the old graves, it occurred to me that when the girl said, like, Steve is in the cemetery, it might have been her way of telling us that he was dead. There was every chance we just totally misinterpreted that, and I was in that cemetery on a complete fool's errand, wasting my time looking for something I wouldn't find. And if that's the case, what I found and saw next is completely irrelevant and is naturally to be disregarded. But, and a big but here, if it is connected to the Steve disappearance, it raises questions that honestly don't bear thinking about. So, as I said, I'm walking down this gravel path and... A handful of people I see are just all checking out the statues, taking pictures, and all that other stuff. Only, I see this one guy, all by his lonesome, and he's walking with purpose, with a plastic bag in his hand. When I say walking with purpose, I mean like, he wasn't there just to hang around and check out the memorials. He was walking fast, like he wanted in and out in as short a time as possible. Just the sight of him filled me with curiosity, but it's not like if I rushed after him, he wouldn't freak out. 
so as much as I tried my best to follow him, he slipped away from my view almost as quickly as he had appeared. Only he'd left something behind, the white plastic bag having just dumped it behind one of the bleach-white tombstones, apparently in the hopes that it would remain hidden from public view. At first, I was just mad. Like who leaves their trash in a graveyard or whatever? But I went to check out what the bag contained. It just looked like a bunch of organ meat. Like I 100% saw something dark enough to be liver in there and some of the other pieces looked like chunks of white fat. It smelled real bad too. Like he might have been hanging on to it for a couple of days before he'd left it there. To this day, it's probably one of the weirdest things to ever happen to me. Finding a bag of meat like that just abandoned in the middle of a ceremonial cemetery. And like I said, whether or not it's even remotely connected to Steve's disappearance is anyone's guess. I mean, the detectives treated me like I was crazy when I brought it up with them in the weeks that followed. They'd sent some beat cops out to the cemetery and they hadn't found a thing. But I also know they seemed totally clueless in their investigation, like they either didn't care about it or just couldn't get a lead anywhere. And that's just how things went. I get in touch every so often, only to be told the investigator hadn't progressed anywhere. It didn't help that it had taken weeks for anyone to report him missing, and the fact that it was me that should have acted earlier gave me this horrendous sense of guilt for the longest time. Steve had no family out here, and I barely knew anything about him. The best I could do was share the few slivers of info I had with the cops, then just hope it came to something. But it came to nothing. And now Steve is just one more name on the missing persons register. A missing persons register that stretches a mile long. The rate at which homeless people go missing around Redwood City is considerably higher than the surrounding areas. And given how difficult it is to conduct any kind of census or research among the homeless, that figure could be even higher than the numbers suggest. The trouble is, people just don't care. Even people who purport to care about social justice are content to focus their attentions on ridiculous niche topics when homeless people are dying and disappearing on the streets of California every single day. I don't know what's going on out here. Whether or not it's just fentanyl killing people off, some kind of serial killer, or something less explainable. But something is killing homeless people at a totally disproportionate rate, and all kinds of other weird stuff is going on to boot. I just pray that whatever it is can be identified and stopped before more people like Steve are lost. People who try so hard to tread water, only to end up slipping beneath the waves. Any of you given that Bumble app a go? I know it seems massively counterintuitive to download an app which requires the girl to make the first move when they're notoriously not the ones to make the first move. But I can assure you, it's definitely worth it. But at the same time, I think the single worst thing that happened to me in 2020 took place just as a result of a Bumble date. So, it all started when I matched with a Welsh girl named Lima. After a day or two of talking, we agreed to meet at a little cafe for a few coffees. We hit it off talking about this and that, and before you know it, we're chatting like we'd known each other for years. One hour turned to two, two to three, and still neither of us was ready to call time on the date. Neither of us drank alcohol that evening, her for religious reasons, me because I'm something of a fitness freak. But while she was drinking mocktails, I was on the coffee and I was on it big time. There came a point where I needed a wee so badly that I was practically doing the entire river dance routine waiting for the one-person toilet to become available. This happens every half an hour without fail almost all night. I have to interrupt her, apologize, and leg it off to the little bathroom to relieve myself. I felt like an absolute idiot having to nip off to the lab so often, but every time I emerged, she'd look up and smile, waving away my apologies with some light mockery of how I have the bladder of a four-year-old. But one time, I emerged from the toilets to see that she's no longer sitting alone, and that someone is sitting in my seat. At first, I thought she just bumped into a guy she knew. She certainly looked quite comfortable talking to him, but it turned out to be the complete opposite. I walked up behind him, playfully put my hands on his shoulders and say, I think he might be in my seat there, mate. It wasn't confrontational or aggressive, just pure banter. 
I expected the guy to jump up, maybe warmly apologize, maybe give a little introduction, something like that. But he didn't. He looked back at me with this look on his face that said, Get your effing hands off of me. And as he's staring up at me, Lima shoots me this look as if to say, Help. Only then am I like, Wait, do you two know each other? Turns out this bloke had been sitting alone enjoying some food and wine and had been making eyes at Lima every so often. Then, when I'd gone off for a wee, he'd taken his opportunity, sat in my seat, and then began to, as Lima put it, flirt so outrageously forward that I thought I was going to puke up my nojito. Now, I actually had to ask this guy to leave us alone before he got up and finally gave me my chair back, but not before he tried to stare me out. I had a few inches on him, that's in height, you oversized children, and I could tell he didn't put half the gym time in that I did, so it's not like I was in the least bit intimidated. It just seemed like he was trying really, really hard to be some comic book idea of what women want, and it was honestly a little bit pathetic. He looked completely and utterly harmless, like a chocolate pistol. He looks like he'd melt at the first sign of trouble. But as I found out later that night... Looks can be dangerously deceiving. So, after the little confrontation at the table, Lima and I laugh it off and carry on with our night. Now Lima can see over my shoulder and therefore also see the creepy guy, but all I can see in front of me is her and one of the cafe's walls, so I have to rely on her to let me know if the guy is still there. I honestly expected him to just leave after such a confrontation. Everyone in the cafe was watching, it was pretty mortifying, but he didn't. He stayed put and continued to make eyes at Lima, which, to her credit, she just ignored. But then when it came to me walking her home, he gets up and pays his bill too. Then yup, you guessed it. I look over my shoulder and as we're passing through Chinatown and guess who I see? Tiny Mr. Stareout, still keeping up the intimidation game by staring out from under his brow obviously too drunk to realize he looked far more comical than scary. Don't get me wrong, I wasn't exactly scared at that point, but we were being followed. It made for something of a tense situation, but nothing I thought I couldn't handle. As we approached her apartment block, I asked Lima if she was comfortable going inside while the guy could see where she lived. She admitted to being uncomfortable about it, but the block had like 50 to 60 flats in it, and unless he got in the door behind her, there was little chance of him working out which unit she lived in. But as it turned out, Lena was way more concerned about me and actually invited me inside for a nightcap. I didn't assume that I was getting lucky, but I wasn't about to turn her down. So I went inside for a cup of this weird ginger tea in the comfort that our little stalker friend would soon get bored and wander off. I was in her flat for no less than an hour and by that time... Each of us was confident that our new friend had departed. We even checked out of her bathroom window, which looked down into the street, and he was nowhere to be seen. So I thanked her for a good night, we had a little smooch, and I started my walk home with that lighter-than-air feeling you get after a successful date. It's around that time that I start thinking something along the lines of, God, imagine if that loser was somehow still following me, which prompts me to look over my shoulder. Lo and behold, there's a single figure following me, maybe 50 or 60 meters behind, with a remarkably similar silhouette to the lad who tried following us. I have to admit to being in a state of disbelief for a moment as I stopped and studied the figure as they approached. Then, after passing under a streetlight, I got a clear look at the person. It was him. You gotta be screwing with me, mate. I said out loud and immediately they stopped. I knew it was him, so him playing at being a statue didn't make a blind bit of difference. I just told him to keep his distance and there'd be no problems, then just carried on with the 20-minute walk back to my place. Every so often I'm checking over my shoulder and this lad is still behind me. Granted he's some way away, but he's definitely following me, and the closer we get to my apartment, the more it becomes obvious that he's making a considerable effort to close the distance. Now, unlike Lima, the apartment I lived in was just one of two in this big old Edwardian. I have the top floors while the other tenant had the ground floor in the basement, complete with his entrance. 
So, if this lad sees what door I go into, he's got my flat. He doesn't have to guess which one of the 60 I'm in. He knows where I live. Obviously, I'm not in the least bit comfortable with that, so I decide on a little show of force to deter my new follower. I turn around and just march right at him. Then, when I'm within about spitting distance, I gave him what for about being a creep and a loser, promising I'll kick his head in if he carries on following me. It seemed to have the desired effect as he started walking off in the complete opposite direction. It was really strange, but I carry on walking, checking over my shoulder one more time and he's gone. Problem solved, right? Well, not quite. About a minute or two goes by and I reach the entrance to a fairly small park. My flat is literally just on the other side of it, so I'm in this blissful ignorance of thinking that not only had I scared the creepy guy off, but that I was so close to home that nothing could possibly hurt me now. I mean, I was on home base, right in my big old backyard. Besides, I'd had a great night. I had drinks with this gorgeous anesthesiologist, definitely securing myself a second date in the process, and I had myself a little tough guy moment with that absolute... Bam. Everything flashed bright for a second, and I felt my knees just buckling under me, almost as if though my brain had switched off power to them. I honestly don't know if I was knocked out for a second or two, but I do know that the next thing I can feel is this sharp, hot pain in the back left side of my head. I knew that I'd been hit by something, I just didn't know what or by who. I was so dazed that it didn't even occur to me that it could have been him. I honestly thought I was just being mugged or something, in which case, it wouldn't have been my first rodeo. I'd been mugged at Knife Point in London back when I was a student, and I needed to just keep my mouth shut, hand over the valuables, and get away with nothing but damaged pride and a lump on my head. So, the only thing I do before trying to find my feet is to toss out my wallet and phone onto the concrete and just be like, just take it and F off. I heard someone wheeze a laugh probably at how pathetic I looked. But when they spoke, I knew exactly who it was. I thought you were going to kick my head in. Now look at you. Whack. It kicked me so hard in the side of the head that I thought my orbital socket might be broken. And in between worrying that I'd end up losing my eye if they kicked me again, it dawned on me the little tow rag who'd been following me had somehow found a way to cut me off and ambush me and it became quite obvious that I was in much, much more trouble than I'd first anticipated. The phone and wallet weren't going to cut it. I needed to get on my feet, and fast. It didn't matter that I was taller and stronger, maybe even faster than this guy. He had the upper hand, and let me tell you, it was not a nice feeling. The force of the kick set me off balance, but I tried to use the momentum to find my feet. If I was drunk, I'd have been utterly screwed. But since I was sober, I did actually manage to get both feet on the ground before trying to bring myself upright. But nope. Another kick hits me right in the corner of the mouth, and I was sent flying backwards again. This time, not only is my mouth filling up with blood, but I can feel the teeth on the left-hand side of my mouth grinding together where the kick had chipped a few of them. It sent my skin crawling as I spat the blood out. I put my hand out and felt something cold and metallic, a fence on which I was once again trying to pull myself up. But again, right as I was about to find my feet, the guy attacked. Only this time, he didn't strike me. He wrapped one arm around my neck and held something cold and sharp over my right eye. I'm not sure if it was a knife or a piece of glass or whatever, but I think that was the single most terrifying moment of my life, thinking, well, I'm going to be blind now and hoping I'll be able to buck him off before he goes for my throat or something. Only he didn't cut me. Instead, he hissed something right into my ear. Let's just say brevity wasn't his strong suit, and I'd rather not type out the actual exchange, but it was as gloating, vicious, and vile as you can imagine, with plenty of references to the date I'd been on that evening. I didn't beg. I didn't cry. I just waited for whatever was going to happen. But thank God he must have seen sense or something. He made some comment about me only being alive the next day because he'd let me live. After that, he 
he gave me one more good punch to the side of the face, then all I heard was the sound of trainers hitting concrete as he legged it. I spent the next few minutes spitting out blood as I tried to find my phone. I think he'd either stamped on it or I'd maybe tossed it with a little too much force because the screen was smashed into bits. But again, a little bit of divine intervention meant it worked just enough for me to hammer out a 999 call, after which I dragged myself to the park's gates and sat there waiting for the ambulance to turn up. Aside from a bit of concussion, a lot of swelling and some chipped teeth, I was pretty much alright. There was no skull fracture, no broken orbital socket, nothing like that, although I'd been lucky to say the least. The doctor said the first wound on the back of my head looked like it had come from a brick or a large rock, and if he'd hit me any harder with it in that particular spot, there's a good chance he'd have just killed me with his first strike. And that was the really scary bit, thinking that all the kicks and punches and threats that came after were like a weird blessing. I was still alive when in some timelines I would be checking in for the big sleep. I was angry about it for a long, long time and I'd be a liar if I said I didn't let that attack change my behavior for the worse for a while. Seeing the guy getting six years for assault and grievous bodily harm really helped things, but still, that wasn't enough for me on some level, and it took me a while to acquiesce. Me and Lima carried on dating for a few months, which was lovely, but she had to move away for work, so obviously we had to call time on it. And the four trips to the dentist were terrible as they basically had to file and cap my teeth one at a time, and that was definitely the worst part. How five minutes turned into an ordeal that lasted months of court dates and dental appointments. That's my one big takeaway from the whole thing, really. How one little misunderstanding can have terrifyingly far-reaching consequences. My friend and I had passed this house many times and not really given much thought until the day we decided to have a closer look. The house was pretty big and it had three floors. All of the windows were missing and it looked like it had been on fire at least twice. It had a stone wall surrounding the property, which we had no difficulty in climbing, navigating through the overgrown garden on the other side of the wall. We eventually reached the front door of the house. There was a small gap in the boards that were covered, so that we could crawl inside one's end. We had to use the light on our phone to see, but we found the downstairs to be completely empty with no furniture. After exploring the downstairs and basement area of the house and finding nothing interesting, we headed for the stairs, reaching the top. We were faced with four doors, each locked with not one, not two, but three sliding old locks on the outside of each door. That's weird. Why would these doors need to be locked so securely from the outside? We thought as we started unlocking one of them. Inside the room was an old metal bed, which looked like something out of a hospital. An armchair, a wardrobe. The other three rooms contained this similar setup. After exploring all four rooms, we wanted to check out the top floor. But the stairs had been destroyed by fire at some point. The only way up was through a hole in the ceiling of one of the four rooms. We pulled over a wardrobe and stood on it to see what was on the floor above. The floor looked unsafe, and it was even darker up there, so I didn't climb all the way up. I just shoved my torch around from where I was. That's when I found an old metal club. With the wrist strap still attached, it was heavy, dented, and obviously well used. After showing my friends what I had found, I left it up there and climbed back down. Because it was so dark inside, we hadn't noticed the sun had set and it was almost pitch black outside. We sat opposite the front door and each began rolling a cigarette discussing what we had found, when something made me look up at one of the windows. To this day, I still struggle to find words to describe what I saw. It was a figure standing in the window of one of the bedrooms. It was not transparent like the traditional ghost, nor was it solid. It was almost like it was made of liquid or smoke, although it was so dark in the room. 
The figure seemed to be illuminated as if it were giving off a light of its own. Despite its hazy appearance, I could make out that it was wearing a white doctor's coat with a name tag on the left breast pocket. The face was too distorted to make out any features, but I could see two large black eyes staring back at me. I sat there completely frozen, trying to comprehend what I was looking at. It could have been seconds, but felt like hours. Suddenly, I regained control of myself and without a word jumped up and sprinted for the wall. As I was running, I was wondering to myself whether I had really seen it or not. At this point, my friend, who was much faster runner than I, overtook me and continued running up the road. Eventually, I caught up to him and asked him why he had been running. What he said haunts me. I just saw a doctor in the window. I have been a trucker my whole life. I started at the age of 18. I was the only one responsible to earn for the family and my uncle had introduced me to the truck, and the truck life, and it was something that fascinated me, and I decided to drive into it and become officially working as a trucker at the age of 18. My first few months as a trucker, I was really doing the long trips. I loved the long journeys. When I was young, it was better. I could do the long trips. Interesting stories were made in that period. I met people. A lot of people were inclined to get a hitchhike in a truck makes one heck of a story to tell, and I was always excited about the people that I would meet on the journey. I was more cautioned about it. I was young and naive, and I thought maybe I control everything in the truck and I would think that there is no way creeps are going to cross paths with me, but one fine day, or would say night, that was not the case. It was December 25th, the holy night of Christmas, and I was out on the tour, and it was just something that had to be done. It was a medical supply shipment, and I just could not say no to that. That's the work of God, and I could possibly not refuse to that. So I was working the Christmas shift. I was working on the shift and trying to get it all delivered in time. The shipment was an emergency shipment, and they needed it in around 12 hours, and I decided to do just one stop after taking the shipment, and it was lover's stop. And I took all the resources and snacks and started my journey and I just put my foot on the accelerator and just kept driving. And about at four hour mark, I saw two cars tailing my truck. I knew what was about to happen, so I made sure that my foot never gets away. And then I saw one of the cars come at the side, and he shot at the truck. And I just kept driving, and I knew I couldn't stop. And so I kept going. And around in six hours, they managed to get me to stop the truck. I wasn't going to let them stop me. So I said openly, I have to deliver this medical equipment. It is an emergency. They need this in six hours and you are already delaying my shipment. It is the matter of six people. Here, take my number and meet me tomorrow at this very spot and we will see this then. I am going now. Don't follow me. And then I left and hoped they didn't shoot me or follow me. And they didn't. As promised, I delivered the shipment in time. An hour to spare and decided to do right on my promise and meet them at the same spot the next day. They were not there. That was the ballsiest thing I ever did as a trucker, and I guess it still is. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. On the morning of October 19, 1971, Cheryl Spiegel woke up a very excited young lady. It was her 10th birthday, and although she was headed to school that morning, her family had promised her cake and presents on her return home. Obviously, she was very excited. It was her day, her special day, so it was only natural that the birthday girl got a few extra minutes in bed, especially when her regular wake-up time was around 5.30 in the morning. If this meant that Cheryl didn't depart for the school bus with her brothers says as she normally did. Instead, she left the house at around 6.25 a.m., headed out into the dark, foggy fall morning all alone. It was a walk that should have just taken a few minutes tops, 
but Cheryl never made it to school that day. In fact, the morning of Cheryl's birthday will be the last time anyone would see her alive in the mysteries surrounding her death with puzzle professional and amateur detectives alike for years to come. Following her missing persons report being filed, local police officers conducted interviews with classmates, neighbors, and members of the Spiegel family itself, but not a single person could provide any useful information. The streets had been all but deserted when Sherwood appeared, when local newspaper began reporting sightings of Cheryl in the surrounding area. The police focused their investigation around the possibility of her running away from home, a dire mistake at a crucial time in the investigation, as it amounted to little more than wishful thinking. Because around two weeks later, a milk delivery driver was out on his usual morning rounds when he found he needed to take a leak. He pulled over to the side of an isolated country road when he noticed an odd grouping of rocks in the creek bed below him. It appeared as though they'd been deliberately stacked almost like a pyramid shape. The driver's curiosity got the better of him, and he headed down the slope to further investigate the odd formation. But when he did so, he noticed a small child-sized arm visible in one of the small crevices. The flesh was hideously discolored, with its owner obviously deceased, so the horrified delivery driver rushed to call 911. Shortly afterwards, emergency services arrived at the scene, collecting the corpse which would soon be identified as the missing Cheryl Spiegel. The birthday girl had been stabbed a total of 26 times with some of the stab wounds so deep that they ran through her completely. However, they didn't appear to have been the result of a knife. Rather, the wounds were small and puncture-like in nature, as if she had been stabbed with a needle-like instrument. She had also been stripped completely nude, but thankfully, there was little evidence of any kind of physical violation having occurred in a horrible twist of fate. It was her older brother's 11th birthday when her father was summoned to identify her body, forcing him to bear witness to the savage, frenzied manner in which she had been killed. Cheryl was buried two days after her body was found on November 6, 1971. Her family held a small ceremony for her at Highland Cemetery in Fort Mitchell, Kentucky and the search for her killer continued with the ever-pervading question. Did her birthday play any significance in her abduction, or was it simply a horrible coincidence? Homicide detectives surveyed the surrounding area but didn't find much of interest. The only pertinent location was a gas station, an ATM machine at a bank, and a McDonald's had stayed open until 5 a.m. Aside from those late-night businesses, there were no reasons to be in the area at such a time. But canvassing the area came up with four major persons of interest, all of which were spoken to by police. The first was a man who lived across the street from the Spiegel house. According to more than one witness statement, this man would sometimes sit on the porch or in his car and watch the children not in a wholesome way either. People say that there was something to this man's stare, something chilling in the years following Cheryl's murder. His concerning behavior continued to make his neighbors uncomfortable, even if he was eventually cleared of suspicion. Although he refused to take a polygraph test, which was highly suspicious, it turned out that he had an airtight alibi, as he had been working as a day laborer for a company in nearby Cincinnati. The second person of interest was another of Cheryl's neighbors, a drug-addicted member of a local car theft ring. He had served prison time, had a history of violence. Some was known to be extremely volatile. His alibi for the morning of Cheryl's disappearance was flimsy at best, and he openly admitted to having seen her walk to the bus stop, making him the last person to see her alive. However, he was open to taking a polygraph test, and he actually passed it, despite several people in the street saying they were terrified of him. The third person of interest was obviously the person who claimed to have found the body, the milk delivery driver. This man lived several counties away from the milk company, but he would end his route each day on the road where Cheryl's body was discovered. This daily proximity to her and her family would have given him ample opportunity to plan a successful kidnapping. 
However, there was no other evidence of his guilt. The man passed a polygraph test and was said to be emotionally devastated by the accusation. Not long after, the police ruled him out. The fourth and final person of interest was a small business owner from the same town. This man was not initially on the police radar as being involved in Cheryl's murder, but several years after, he was charged with assaulting young girls pleading guilty in a court of law. There was local talk about him bragging about having stabbed Cheryl and putting her in the creek, but the man flatly denied those rumors as hearsay. Police did interview him and he agreed to take a polygraph test, which he passed beyond him supposedly bragging about the murder. There was no forensic evidence to ever tie him to the crime. It should be made clear that Cheryl's dad and stepmother were never considered suspects, and her biological mother was nowhere near Kentucky during the early 70s. However, a couple of interesting facts remain. Cheryl's father said he saw his daughter leave for the bus stop at 6.25 a.m., and no one else reported having seen Cheryl out on the street, which surely would have been busy with other kids and parents out and about that morning. What's more, after Cheryl's body was found, no headstone was ever purchased for her by her immediate family, and the speaker was left town entirely just two months later. Cheryl's brother later said that their father never talked about Cheryl or her murder ever again. Whether this was down to guilt or simply grief, it's impossible to know. So what really happened to little Cheryl Spiegel? Was it some kind of horrible accident? Or was foul play to blame? And what exactly made all those tiny pinprick wounds that punctured the length of the breadth of her tiny body? At best, some kind of vicious predatory killer with an unusual weapon cost them. But at worst, someone or something is still out there, and it's hunting children.